Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event today, interrogating uh, the indigenous and Northeast India political movements, cultural forces, and the performative capital. I'm Monica Sinclair. I'm the Associate Country Director for India at the Lakshmi Mission uh, and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard University. Um, I stepped in this position very recently, nearly a month and a half ago, as telling uh, Professor Bose just now, uh, after stint as an academician and worked with the Fidel Uh The Lakshmi Mission and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard, um, in short, also called the Mission Institute or LMSAI, uh, to its two offices, one in Boston, another in New Delhi, uh, engages in interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues in South Asia, and the event today is organized through the New Delhi office of the Middle Institute. Uh, a little about the Institute. Uh, audience in the back, are they able to hear me well? Okay, thank you. Uh, founded in 2003 uh, to further Harvard University's engagement with South Asia, the Middle Institute works together with faculty members, students, and indigenous institutions to disseminate knowledge, build capacity, and inform policy. Uh, two scholarly exchanges and fellowships sponsor lectures and conferences at Harvard and in the region, and the conference today is an example of that. Uh, bring together knowledge from South Asia to Harvard via research grants and build a community of stakeholders, and that includes all of you today. Uh, Harvard University formally recognized uh, South Asia initiatives as an academic institute in 2013. Our work spans across Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. In New Delhi, we are a very small team of six staff members who work on supporting all the activities at the Institute. All of them are here today. Uh, if you're here, please raise your hands or just wave. Amit, Namita, Pooja, Sushma, Shamra. Uh, you can interact with them anytime during the day. They have put in a lot of hard work in making things happen uh, for the event today. Uh, we also have currently four fellows who are hosted at the New Delhi office. Uh, today's conference was conceptualized by one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Ankur Pukan. Ankur, if you're there. Okay. Um, under the mentorship of and guidance of Professor Sugata Bose, uh, the gardener professor of oceanic history and affairs at Harvard University, and also the chair for today's event. Uh, thank you so much, Ankur and Professor Sagata, for putting this together, putting together a wonderful event. Um, we are joined today also by our other three fellows in the office, Annie, Mayanka, I think she's outside helping with the front desk, Trishti. Okay, great. Uh, you'll see them around helping with various pieces of the conference today. Uh, thank you all uh, for supporting us during the event. Um, I would like to pass on my sincere thanks to all speakers uh, who may not be in, in the room today uh, for traveling long distances to join us for the event. Two of our speakers will be joining us online given their international location. Um, and unfortunately, one of our earlier planned co-chairs could not travel to Delhi due to a family emergency. And we had to make slight change in the speaker lineup. Some of you might have received the emails around that. The conference booklet is still not updated because it was printed before then, so sorry about that. But we're really thankful to Professor Aurobh Jyoti for stepping in to fill the place. Uh, Professor Aurobh Jyoti will also deliver the keynote address today. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, finally, we're really grateful to all the audience members uh, for joining us today, either in person, all of you here, or the ones who are joining us online, uh, giving us an opportunity to engage with you through this platform. Uh, we hope to have more such engagements with you in near future, and I really look forward to interacting with some of you during the break time. Um, and as we talk of the break, I would I want to turn uh, take this last minute to go over some conference logistics or uh, the event logistics. Um, all sessions will take place in this same room, and for the people who are joining us through Zoom, uh, the link for all the sessions remains same throughout the day. Uh, there's no separate links for different sessions. There will be two tea breaks and one lunch break, as you can see under the session details in your conference booklet. Uh, tea or lunch will be served in the hallway, which is right outside the lecture hall. Some of you might have seen that place while you were walking in down the stairs. Uh, we will begin with our keynote speaker address and then do two panel discussions with breaks in between. If you have any questions, you can reach out to our staff or fellows, and you can identify them by the lanyards that they're wearing, the maroon ones. Um, 
for the speakers, please take note that we have a timekeeper in our fellow, uh, Annie Royston, uh, to assist you keeping track of your speaking duration. So just have a look at her when you are doing the talking. Uh, with that note, um, we formally open to begin our event today, and I would like to invite Professor Sugata Bose, uh, Gardiner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University, to preside over the sessions and keynote address. A little brief on Professor Sugata before I hand over the podium to him. Uh, Professor Bose specializes in modern South Asian history uh, and Indian Ocean history. He received his PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he was a Guggenheim Fellow in 1997. He has authored multiple books, including Majesty's Opponent, Subhash Chandra Bose, and India's Struggle Against Empire, and A Hundred Horizons, The Indian Ocean in the Age of Global uh, Empire. Um, and is currently writing a book titled Asia After Europe, Decline and Rise of a Continent. He's also working as a general editor on the Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean. Thank you so much, Professor Bose, for joining us today and presiding over the event. Um, welcome all of you again. Enjoyed the, one, the day with wonderful lineup of speech sessions and by engaging in conversations with our experts. Thank you so much. Over to you, Professor Bose. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone for braving uh, the cold wave in Delhi to uh, join uh, this uh, conference. Uh, you know, when I first uh, arrived at Harvard to take up the Gardner chair in the fall of 2001, I was asked by my, by my colleague, uh, Bill Kirby, to write up an academic plan for the building of South Asian studies, and in particular, uh, South Asia Institute at Harvard. And this was adopted by the Asia Center as a whole in December of 2001. And we started our activities uh, in 2002 uh, with a series which was uh, titled South Asia Without Borders, because we wanted to creatively cross the area studies boundaries around South Asia. Um, even though uh, the uh, uh, South Asia Initiative, as it was called then, was formally launched with a very large conference in uh, the fall of 2003. Uh, the academic plan that I had written more than 20 years ago uh, envisaged exactly the kind of uh, serious and substantive uh, scholarly uh, conversations of the kind that we hope to have today. And the first person that I would really like to thank for conceptualizing uh, this conference is the uh, fellow of the Mitchell Institute, uh, Umkit Tamali Khokan, and all of the staff at the Delhi office uh, of the uh, Institute for working very hard to get us all together. Um, it's, I think, extremely important to focus uh, on India's Northeast, uh, not just because uh, it is of great uh, political and cultural significance, uh, but also because there has been some wonderful scholarship, very often by scholars from the Northeast uh, on Northeast India, which often doesn't get to be for, uh, highlighted uh, at academic events. And that is something that we wish to uh, rectify uh, today. Uh, we have uh, quite a few major scholars of uh, the Northeast who are joining us today. I'm sorry that uh, Shunji Borua, who is the author of uh, In the Name of the Nation, his most recent book, uh, cannot join us for a family emergency. But to start us off, uh, we have uh, Arup Jyoti Saikia, who's professor of history in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Uh, I have been privileged to visit uh, IIT Guwahati uh, in recent years, uh, both to give the Shurja Kumar Bhunya uh, lecture, uh, but also uh, to keynote a really wonderful conference on Gandhi that took place just before the pandemic uh, struck us. Um, Arup Jyoti's work uh, spans uh, across uh, environmental uh, history, peasant history, uh, and uh, political history. Uh, his uh, uh, first book was Forests and Ecological History of Assam, 1826 to 2000, published in 2011. 
uh, followed by an agrarian history titled A Century of Protest, Peasant Politics in Assam since 1900, uh, which came out in 2014. Uh, and, uh, and then came uh, his uh, wonderful book on the Brahmaputra River uh, titled The Unquiet River, an environmental history of the Brahmaputra in 2019, uh, which was shortlisted for the Kamala Devi Chakrapadhyay Book Award in 2020, and also got an honorable mention for Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy Book Prize in 2021 by the Association for, uh, of Asian Studies in North America. Uh, his uh, political history of Assam is uh, about to uh, be published in April. It is titled The Quest for Modern Assam, a History 1942 to 2000. And we are very fortunate to get an early glimpse of what will be uh, coming uh, in the book. Uh, he will speak, be speaking today about the long 1950s. So over to you, Arupya. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Bose. Thank you, all of you, uh, for coming. And it's, it's wonderful uh, uh, that Howard had uh, invited me. And I'm really privileged to give this keynote address. Thank you so much. The title of my talk is uh, The In Search of Modern Assam Dreams, Promises, and the Anxieties of the Long 1950s. Any discussion on the history of the indigenity in India's Northeast, which, is, which this conference aims to discuss, might remain inconclusive without an understanding of the economic and the political turmoil that swept through Assam in the first decades of the India's independence, as well as attempts made by the, in Assam to search for and reinforce the idea of a classical Assamese past. The search for an Assamese classical past began earlier but the 1950s gave these processes strong political and institutional stability. The long 1950s were also years of dreams, promises, and anxieties for the region and its residents. This lecture cannot do justice uh, to examine in full this troubling years and troubling events, but I have selected a few episodes from this long decade to highlight some of those broad patterns and developments drawn from Assam's economic, political, and cultural developments. My lecture recounts Assam's domestic economic challenges, her cultural ambitions, which shaped her political destiny during the second half of the 20th century. These processes would play a crucial role in subsequent decades in the making of the indigenity in the region. Before I begin, let me briefly outline how Assam's post-independent journey is seen in the standard academic work. Assam is essentially seen in most works as influenced by two major political developments. First, Assam's quest to become a linguistically coherent political and cultural unit within the political milieu of Indian Union. And second, the abiding fear among the Assamese of losing out, quote unquote, to outsiders in a fiercely competitive economic, cultural, and political environment. But beyond this standard narrative, there is a set of complex events with deep processes and interconnected, interconnected developments, which sets Assam's fate in this second half of the 20th century. These events were influenced by Assam's distant past, troubled histories when dealing with its linguistics, environmental, and geostrategic situations. All these elements played a cruel uh, role in a series of catastrophic political developments, as well as in its economic underdevelopment. Let me begin by acknowledging that the map of Assam in 1947 was not marked by a coherence of unity, either culturally, ecologically, politically, and administratively. The challenges of governing such a complex geographical mosaic 
became apparent soon enough. The Assamese speaking ruling elite tried to assert control over the complex cultural and environmental landscape. The Lusai Hills, the Naga Hills, the Kasi and Jayantia Hills, the Barak Valley, and many other areas inhabited by different ethnic and linguistic groups. Not all residents of New Assam identified themselves as Assamian. Many expressly articulated very different subnationalism. The superior attitude of the Assamese officials, judges, politicians were surely not to be welcomed by many groups with distinct political, cultural, economic aspirations. The Assamese leadership failed to adequately address the popular aspirations in the hill districts. The superior attitude of many Assamese officials were resented by groups with distinct identities and cultures. In the 1950s, Nehru advised Assamese leaders to listen to the voices from the hills. Nehru's close aide, Perry Arloin, the sport trained anthropologist, helped the Indian government to shape Assam's future, keeping in view the sensitive nature of the hills or the tribal areas. This attempt failed. It was viewed as patronizing by the hill leaders, and it, it only deepened the resentment of the Assamese elites against New Delhi. Mean, meanwhile, the tribal elites' anger against Assamese cultural and political dominance began to assume various shapes, waves of protest, often violent, and with the support of a large majority of people, swept through the hills, much to the disappointment of the Assamese Congress leaders. The people in the hills who spoke different languages felt it strongly against the Assamese ruling elite for the latter's refusal to appreciate their ways of life. Meanwhile, the linguistic reorganization of the country led to the restructuring and the emergence of several new Indian states in the decades of 1950s, 6 and 66. Though Assam stoutly resisted that his attempt to redraw the political boundaries, Years of protected people's movement in tribal districts finally gave birth to Nagaland, Meghalaya, Mizoram. Assam had literally been cut to size. The con contraction in area and the decrease in the population of the United Assam of August 1947 were viewed as tragedies by the Assamese ruling elite and the middle classes. That distrust never went away. The birth of new states was a welcome development for many as these significant political experiments in Indian federalism largely fulfilled the political and the social aspirations of various ethnic communities. Meanwhile, those who struggled for a cohesive Assamese identity had necessarily to draw from its diverse multilingual, multi-ethnic and religious histories and layered past. Alongside the very complexity and troublance of the Assam's diverse environments, ecological, political and cultural, have denied any singular understanding of the reason. The idea of Assam has constantly evolved with great adjustment having to be made in response to the tectonic fractures caused by numerous and varied challenges. Meanwhile, at independence, as Assam negotiated its future position in the larger schema of India's political framework, there was a turmoil within Assam. The Assam government led by Gopinath Bordoloi faced several pressing domestic issues. Besides the contentious questions of land redistribution, uh, low agrarian productivity and incomes, poor infrastructure and a struggle for control over the state's resources, such as oil, the Naga demand for independence intensified and it became a cause for India's national concern. The first shock however, came from a section of the rural population of Assam who had infused great dynamism into the anti-imperialist mass politics in the earlier years. The spectacular rise of the communists in Assam's countryside posed a challenge to the Congress-led government in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. Their popularity saw a phenomenal increase post-independence, largely among the rural poor, which included sharecroppers and landless laborers. One of the hardest jobs of the Nehru's government was to deliver on many of the Congress pre-independence promises on agrarian reform. Some Indian provinces had initiated piecemeal and land reforms by the late 1940s. To bring parity in those efforts and to understand post-reform situation, 
The Congress formed an Agrarian Reform Committee in 1948, headed by noted Gandhian economist J.C. Kumarappa. The Agrarian Reform Commission visited Assam in July of that year, in 1948. As the committee heard the views of a cross section of the Assamese people, it emerged that the overall mood was against sharecropping. There was a demand for a shilling on land holding. Most people were familiar with the massive rural mobilization against sharecropping in Assam. Many public figures and those from the well-to-do families who did not necessarily endorse communist political ideas still took a hard view of the sharecropping. Public opinion was against the Jamindari system too. Many stressed the need for greater efficiency in farming, apparently sharing their displeasure against Jum in the hills. Kumarappa's visit gave Assam the Assam government the most awaited uh, ideological and the political backing to push for the abolition of the Zamindari. The Assam Legislative Assembly had passed the Assam State Acquisition of Zamindari's bill on the March 28, in 1949, to abolish the Zamindari system in the two districts of Assam, but it had to wait for presidential confirmation till July 1951 for it to become an act. The powerful Jamindars, like many, uh, many of their counterparts across India, challenged the legality of this law, but lost their case in 1954 in the Supreme Court of India. A year later, the government, Assam government, brought all Jamindari property under its control. Meanwhile, tenants of the Jamindars, who were mostly tribal, who were being mobilized by the communists, uh, and who had long dreamed for such a state, demanded their rights as tenants be secured. Most of the tenants in the Zamindari states of Gualpara uh, belong to the tribal communities, Borus, Kos, Ravas, or Garus. From the early 1940s onwards, Zamindars had allowed settlers from neighboring Bengal too. However, the settlers had hardly benefited from the Zamindari abolition as the land, land rights were not transferred to them immediately in the 1950s. Few more pieces of legislation had come into existence between 1948 and 1959 to fulfill the Gandhian promises of land reform. These laws took uh, on the economically and socially and powerful one and addressed the massive agrarian discontent discussed here. They combined two socialistic goals to disseminate, uh, to disseminate the might of the landed proprietors, including the tea planters, and redistribute land according to the principles of social justice. The Assamese leaders suffered another major setback in the mid-1950s. In 1953, the Assam Oil Company's drillers found oil at 9,700 feet, the deepest in India, deepest river in India. This oil reserve could support a production of 2.5 million tons of crude oil a year. Everyone in Assam thought this would bring greater economic prosperity. The hope came from the fact that India had already embarked on a program of rapid industrialization. In 1956, the Indian government, supported by the private oil companies, decided to establish a refinery in Kolkata to re refine this crude oil. Nehru's government, much to the dismay of the Assamese political sentiment, denied Assam the opportunity to establish another oil refinery. A political battle ensured in which the participation of cross-section of the Assamese urban population became very clear. Under pressure, another technical committee suggested either Kolkata or Barauni, a small town eastern Bihar on the banks of Ganga, as possible choices. Barauni was the better choice because of its easier access to the pan-Indian trade networks. Assam had strategic and economic disadvantages, Nehru's government thought. Yet her crude oil being transported to a refinery in a far away places met with tremendous resistance. In the eyes of the Assamese, a second petroleum refinery could potentially change her economic destiny. Nehru's government tried to reason with the Assamese leaders. Assam, however, refused to back down and open negotiation directly with the French government to refine her crude oil. This should surely cause worry to the Indian government. After a war of, war of wars and violent street protests, Assam got her second oil refinery in 1961. It had been about the same symbols as much as substance, but Assam's economic prosperity hardly improved. 
between 1947 and 1970, its per capita income and GDP declined. The petroleum industry prospered, but it could hardly raise the general economy of the state. Like the colonial tea plantations, this new wave of industrialization had a very limited impact on the local economy. As the 1940s came to an end and the 50s began to move ahead in the entire scheme of things, now it seems the Brahmaputra Valley and the Assamese speaking elite were at the center as though the entire force of circumstances was directed towards the river of Brahmaputra. A newly shaped geography and political life inspired the Assamese, primarily consisting of a large number of predominantly Assamese speaking ethnic groups to refashion their cultural markers. Popular as classical cultural practices were refashioned, their place within the Assamese culture was repositioned. If traditional rituals, trash, food attain new meaning and life, institution and public, other public organizations equally became active to resuscitate an Assamese culture based on language, cultural values, and culinary practices. To understand this better, I need to retail accounts of Assam's new cultural and intellectual developments that took place in the 1950s. One of the first tasks of the Gupinath Baudelaire's government was to fulfill Assam's desire to have an university of its own. The Gohat University Act was passed by the Assam legislature in September 1947. The fact that this was barely within a month of India becoming independent indicates how central the university was to, project, to the project of modern Assam. Assam had two government funded colleges and few private colleges uh, uh, run with the help of private donations and student fees. But these were all affiliated to the Calcutta University, which conferred degrees. This had high, very high standards of teaching in both sciences and humanities, and all of this had left a deep and long lasting impact on the minds of its students. The newly born Gohati University, a dream denied in the colonial era, came into existence now. And after decades of political and cultural mobilization and promise to steer these aspirations, its scholars trained in literature, history, folklore, anthropology were all to spell out the agenda of the society, history of indigenousness, and the university that they represented. Many of them would claim to speak on behalf of a larger Assamese community, universities of the valley. There were none in the Southern Valley until the 1980s. They played a significant role, not only in training human resources for Assam's own future, but they also rediscovered the classical Assamese language and culture. The universities and their people became the intellectual torch bearers of Assam's social life. A motley group of scholars renewed their attempt to retell and rediscover Assamese classical and the heroic past. Gohati University's ambitious program of teaching Assamese language and literature had many parallel developments. The most important initiative of this time was a series of publications on Assamese literary history. The project of writing histories of the Assamese language and the literature had been underway since the mid 19th century. As the 19th century progressed, the early Assamese nationalists repeatedly invoked Assam's rich literary history. Following a series of such works, a major cultural mission was undertaken between 1910s and the 1960s. This project continued subsequently and reassured the Assamese literary workers that their cherished language and literature held a significant place in India's literary history. An account of the long evolutionary history including the growth and development of the Assamese script was already published in 1936 by a historian called Sarbeshar Horma Kotoki. Kotoki traced the earliest specimen of the Assamese script to the seventh century AD. Kotoki's conclusion was based on the discovery in 1912 of a copper plate inscription dating back to 610 AD from the time of the Assamese king Pastor Burmana. Kotoki concluded that Assamese script emerged from the Brahmi script, one of the principal sources of Indian language scripts. And he said that the further archaeological discoveries could 
pulls this data further back. Kotoki's theory was in part a response to the prevalent idea given currency by Bengal's celebrated literary historian Dinesh Chandra Sen and the archaeologist Rakhal Das Banerjee that the Assamese script was a variation of the Bengali script. However, historians of the Assamese script would have to wait for some more time for Kotoki's theory to be widely accepted. In the first decades of the 20th century, Assamese scholars also began to prove the question of the origin of the Assamese language. An important question discussed was how much of the origin of Assamese is owed to the Sanskrit. Linguists generally agreed that the Vedic Sanskrit had branched into two broad directions. One took the shape of a classical Sanskrit and largely remained a popular literary language, and the other increasingly described as Prakrit fulfill both literary and the colloquial requirements. The evolution of the Indo-Aryan languages such as Hindi, Bengali, Marathi, etc., meandered through the Prakrit, a term reserved for a compendium of tongues extensively used in different parts of India from the 4th or the 5th century BC to the 8th century AD. The majority of the linguists agreed that before 100 AD, Prakrit had evolved from being the language of the masses into three different orders of literary languages, Magadhi, Maharani, Maharashtri and Saurashini. The Irish linguist administrator, George Abraham Gershon, believed that it was from Magadhi branch of the early Assamese ball. These tongues, therefore, thereafter developed into Aprabhamsa and matured into the various modern Indo-Aryan languages that are spoken today. What was the position of the Assamese among the Indo-Aryan languages? Assamese scholar in the 19th century generally subscribed to the view that Assamese language one of the, was one of the direct branches of the Indo-Aryan family. This idea was concretized between 1903 and 1935 in the workshop Gerson and the Assamese linguist Banikan Tokakoti. Though not everyone concurred, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, the acclaimed linguist, had, however, in 1912, revived the idea that Assamese had originated from Sanskrit. And I quote him, Sanskrit is not the mother of the Assamese, rather sister, mother, sister of mother only, quote him. A small group of scholars directed their, attempt, their attention to the role of Prakrit in the evolution of the Assamese. Their view was that the Assamese owed its origin to different states of Prakrit that Assamese may have directly descended from the Hindu aryan family was a view that was sure to receive mass appreciation. But it was not accepted by many scholars. One of them, Kalira Medhi, not only explained how Assamese originated from a combined background of both Sorosini and Magadhi Prakriti, Prakrit, but he opined that uh, the tibeto Burman languages spoken by many tribes, and I quote him, left permanent marks in the Assamese language. While this scholar's debate had proved into the origin of the Assamese language, some others continued to concentrate on the evolutionary pattern of the Assamia script and the fact that it was an ancient language. This scholar's analysis, uh, scholar's analysis of the rise of the Assamese language and the script was linked to their passion for the language and antiquity. Their conviction was reaffirmed by the extensive reinterpretation of the inscriptions and reading of the old manuscripts. If the former were seen as a proof of the ancientness of the Assamese script, the latter embodied the evolution of the several modern branches of the script. The large numbers of manuscripts written between the 15th and the 18th centuries were now read using advances made in India's textual studies traditions. Knowledge of the older variety of the script brought additional rewards. Those who were trained in all in all brand styles of the Assamese script now could read rediscover the richness of the old Assamese text. The discovery of the two fifth century inscriptions in 1955 and 1972 helped these scholars to antedate the origin of the Assamese script by two more centuries. Those who considered this to be the earliest evidence of the rise of the Assamia script argued that the parentis of the early Assamese script could be traced to the family of the Indian scripts known as Kutila, 
which developed as a proto-regional script from Brahmi. Others, however, suggested that there was little evidence to prove that the Assam script originated from Brahmi. The mid 20th century was a time for clarity and the consolidation of the Assam idea of the Assamese classical past, as I have suggested. The rediscovery and the celebration of the past, some of which has began in the last decades of the 19th century, came to be centered around the idea of Assamese Vaishnavite classical literature. This project of the discovery of the Assamese literary and cultural heritage largely through the works of scholars who were male and belonged to the upper caste families was further hastened when the Assamese began to be taught at the University of Calcutta as a part of the Indian language courses since 1919. Since then, the scholarly publication of a wide range of Vaishnavite literature, literary works, continued to receive the patronage of scholars and publishers. Assamese writers were uh, they promised to furthering the cause of their motherland and the modernization and the enrichment of their literary tradition were part of this play. The majority drew the ideological inspiration from a mix of their vernacular world and Western literary thinking. They had inherited a rich scribal culture and uh, which had prospered before the 19th century. Some of them were, some of them were proud owners of putis, manuscripts of various kinds drawn from a multi-religious cultural milieu. Literary historians did not use the word classical to identify a special body of literary works of the earlier period. Their preferred word was Puroni, literally translated as old and figuratively as golden age. In this body of Puroni of Homiakahito, old Assamese literature, which included the rich Vaishnava literature, the Assamese Bronji, Chronicle, and the folk literature, they recognized the exemplary character of the Assamese literary past. In the early 20th century, the Assamese readers had often considered this work as trivial books of verse read by ordinary language, villagers, and I quote it from an early text. Panikanta Kagoti, uh, the linguist, rediscovered and elevated their literary merit through a series of essays. Kakuti and his contemporaries saw that these works needed to be reappraised and made available to a wider readership of modern Assamese mind and uh, readers. They enthused the Assamese readers morally, culturally, and as a nation, and their rediscovery benefited book, pub book publishers, readers, and the Assamese as a Zati, a cohesive community. The most celebrated example of this was this was the editing and the printing of the biographical accounts of the Vaishnava saints. The widely popular as an oral tradition and a sacred heritage among the followers of the Assamese Vaishnavism, it was recited as a part of everyday religious activity. Before beginning its life in print, it was among the thousands of uh, among the thousands of manuscripts lying in the secret corners of family homes or religious places. The anonymously authored Kotha Guru Sarito, a wide ranging account of Assam's Vaishnava science, which was believed to have been composed from oral tradition in the 18th century and received as a gift by Banikanta Kakoti from his religious preceptor, was edited and published in 1952. The Sarit Putis emerged as a land through which Assam's classical past was now scrutinized marking as a courageous departure from the powerful tradition of hagiography, literary historians use methods of textual criticism to study these sarittas, use them as an archive to understand Assam's material transformation in the earlier centuries. Over the years, their works elevated these biographical works into Assamese canonical text. The sarits were also increasingly considered as the true heir to the ancient inscriptions giving greater clarity to the historical lineage of the Assamese language. From the mid 20th century, Assam witnessed the publication of a wide spectrum of the Assamese literary work. The introduction of the systematic study of the Assamese language and literature as a part of the university curriculum since the early decades of the 20th century remained an additional driving force. Of these numerous works, some stood out and received the attention of readers and literary critics. 
as literary production in Assamese and its use as the language governance as if spectacular progress, many speakers of the tribal languages of Assam quietly grew worried as they could foresee the trouble. In an age of growing self-determination among ethnic groups, one could hardly expect the tribal population to adopt Assamese as their language and discard their own. Rising uh, ethnic, political, and cultural consciousness and the fluid linguistic landscape made the promotion of Assamese as the exclusive language of Assam of the Assam state as a daunting task towards the end of the 1950s. Meanwhile, visualization of the varied forms of Hindu religious practices as the predominant cultural forms of the region contributed to the tribal communities and practitioners' non-Aryan linguistic being dislocated from the center space of the Assamese society and the culture. The Renaissance in Assamese cultural and the literary history took a violent political turn in the summer of 1960. Clouds have been gathering over Assam's political landscape for years. Universities and the scholarship produced therein gave fresh courage and confidence to the Assamese elites to pass with the government to declare Assamese as an official language of the state. However, Assamese was not everyone's mother tongue. It is beyond doubt that the years between the early 1940s and the end of the 1950s were decisive in the making of the modern Assam. Being a frontline province of British India, Assam was deeply affected by the loss and the subsequent reconquest of Burma by the British, as well as by the bloody battles in the defense of Imphal and Kahima. Immediately after the end of the World War II in the 1945, powerful winds of change began to blow across the subcontinent culminating in the independence and partition in 1947. All these events had a long-term impact on the province, which was as much as political, economic, as it was military and otherwise. The early decades of decolonization saw the unleashing of a range of new social energies, political forces that soon became critical to the making of modern Assam. In fact, uh, through the second half of the 20th century, Assam's development was tied to the merit, flourishing, and foreseeable events. The state's improvised economy and fragile political landscape created the background for the social conflicts and cultural experiments, which marked these decades and often produced results having catastrophic and long-term consequences. Assam directed its energies towards overcoming these frequent challenges, but found itself working in a political and socially tight group position. Among other things, three critical developments that have dominated the state's long journey, Assam's continuous sense of revenge against India's federal economic arrangement, its relentless struggle to combat uh, its internal challenges arising from political, social, and economic aspirations of various communities, and most significantly, the evolving anxieties against those who were considered to be dangerous outsiders. I quote, it is quote and unquote. Population mobility, one of the driving forces behind Assam's rise to economic modernity and partly an offshoot of capitalist desire of Imperial Britain, continues to, highly, continues to be a highly contested subject and its relations to the politics of relentless suspicion and suffering. A passion for the language as a marker of identity and a type of identity politics continues to animate the disparate sections and classes of Assamese speakers. So does the shifting definition of a being an Assamese or the history of indigeneity, who is, is not genuinely Assamese, has never perhaps mattered more in the all India setting. And I have little doubt that this description of Assam of the 1950s can be a critical reference point for a discussion on the history of indigeneity in India's Northeast. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Arup Jyoti, for uh, setting us uh, on our way with a marvelous uh, keynote on the early history of uh, post-independence uh, Assam. Uh, as was to be expected, uh, Arup Jyoti has uh, uh, drawn on uh, both the agrarian and environmental history of, of that uh, era uh, uh, in his interpretation 
of the political history of uh, post-colonial Assam. Uh, I found uh, the discussion of uh, the peasant movement, the sharecroppers' agitation, uh, to be uh, most uh, illuminating. Now, of course, uh, J.C. Kumarappa was a Gandhian. Uh, he was not a Nehruvian socialist. Um, he was a member of the National Planning Committee of the Congress uh, set up by Shubhas Chandra Bose in 1938. But uh, we know that, uh, you know, the Kumarappa Commission's recommendations were not implemented anywhere in India, with the possible exception of uh, uh, Kerala, mm -hmm. uh, and that too belatedly after 1957. Uh, I also uh, found the discussion of uh, the uh, 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 the controversies over where to establish oil refi refineries, uh, how to share oil revenues, and so on, uh, very pertinent to an understanding of Assam in that uh, in that period. And then, of course, uh, Aurobindo Jyoti moved uh, to discussing intellectual and cultural de developments. Uh, and uh, that, too, is uh, very new and very refreshing. Uh, I uh, basically wanted to ask whether uh, what you're saying about uh, Assam in the long 1950s can be placed in the context of uh, new work that is being done uh, on the post-colonial transition, uh, and in particular, the federal dilemma in South Asia as a whole. Um, uh, you know, one of my advanced PhD students, Aniket Day, whom you know well, uh, is drawing a very important analytical distinction between the imperial lineages of federalism and the anti-colonial lineages of federalism. The imperial concept of federation very often ended up buttressing centralization. And that is the strand that seemed to have been inherited by the center of post-colonial India. But there had been many anti-colonial lineages of what might be called genuine federalism, envisioning India as a whole, as a true federal union. And these ideas emerged from many different regions uh, of the subcontinent uh, through the late 19th and the early decades of the 20th century which may have lost out in the final battle for state power in 1947. And if that is so, uh, you know, can there be comparisons uh, between uh, what Assamese uh, intellectuals and uh, political leaders were aspiring for, despite what you have shown to be the many conflicts with, uh, between the plains and the hills, uh, the disenchantment of, uh, uh, many of the hill peoples against the Assamese political elite. But despite all of that, when you were narrating in such rich detail uh, what was going on in the field of the setting up of Gohati University and uh, new scholarship on la language uh, and script and literature in Assamese, you know, it seemed to me that, you know, much the same was going on in that period, let's say, with uh, Tamil language and literature. Uh, and there was a similar kind of a strong uh, uh, disappointment with uh, you know, the stances that were being taken by the Indian, uh, Indian political center. So what's distinctive about Assam? What seems to be uh, you know, part of parallel developments taking place in many regions, which were unhappy with the decision to go back on the promise to have a general uh, a substantive federal union uh, in uh, you know after uh, after independence that's the broad point uh, i also wanted to ask a, a sort of specific question because you haven't emphasized uh, that aspect in your lecture you know in the conventional telling of the history of that period the fact that uh, educated Bengalis, particularly Bengali Hindus, uh, dominated in, the educa uh, in, in education, in the services and professions, 
uh, seem to have been, you know, highlighted in some of the earlier literature. Uh, you know, how important was that, do you think, in the politics that unfolded, uh, particularly the crisis of 1960 and into the, uh, into, into the 1960s? Now, you don't have to uh, give me extended uh, answers to the questions that I have raised. You might want to make a brief response because I do want to bring in uh, a very knowledgeable, I think, and a very patient audience into the discussion as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, Professor Bose. Uh, I'm definitely I have uh, agreed from uh, by reading and talking to Anikhet's work. I think that has been a uh, really important thing. Thank you for bringing his work into this discussion. I think this whole question of uh, the constituent assembly discussion and this evolving idea of India's federalism and the way it has taken shape in India's northeast, I think that is a spectacularly missing aspect from the India's political history of this particular time. Uh, and this is where some of the fascinating accounts of the way that reasons for this schema of Indian federalism uh, was tested, was produced, and it was debated. In fact, uh, very rarely, I think, in our scholarly discussions, we have been into the details of the Baudelaire Committee's visit into the different parts of the northeastern India in the months towards the end of 1946 and early 1947. I'm not into the final outcome of the Baudelaire Committee's visit. It is the six schedule, as we know, all know about it. But more fascinating is the community's understanding of India's federal structure. In fact, Kasi is, they came came to meet the Baudelaire Committee with a handwritten constitution, what the constitution should be, right? All different kinds of arrangements about politics, about their own local committees placed in the larger story. I think two parallel development took place around this time, end of 46 and early 47, as this idea of Indian constitution began to take shape and this idea of federalism began to, was, uh, was, concrete, was getting concretized. One is this question of economic resources. You know, uh, Sadullah, who was Assam's premier previously, now who became a Christian, critical member in the drafting committee of the Indian constitution, he had definitely better understanding of economics because he was in the administration. He was also finance minister in previously in the Assam government. So he knew this walking of finance, how it would work, and now suddenly, uh, in 1947, this finance question, though we discussed about language, we discussed about many things in the constitution, that became a crucial issue. How the Indian states will share resources with the sense with the Indian government before these questions of taxation came in. In fact, they all began to inherit and they refer to the 1920s, 1930s, and the early 1940s, different kind of government reports that were there and who is designed this future of Indian economy, right? How this will go on. I think this is where these questions of the federal dilemma came in, right? They knew that Assam is going to have a very secure place culturally and politically in this new story. But what about the economy? I think that was the most pressing problem for the Assam's politicians. In fact, both Bordului and uh, Mohammed Sadullah, right, they really debated before the Constituent Assembly and Sadullah as an insider of the drafting committee to, to secure, the, to bring in or highlight these questions of royalty, the questions of the Jude, questions of industries, all these questions were debated. I think it is high time for us to, for us to redirect our attention to see this evolve, evolution of the federal governance in the late 1940s through this lenses of economic redistribution of the economic resources. Uh, on the questions of, I know that I have not answered fully your answer, and uh, maybe I can bring in those questions as I uh, try to answer more questions. I think these questions of dominance of the Bengali officials in the government structure, I think we really need to look an, into that by numbers, by the numerical strength. My sense and my uh, sense is the Bengalis by 1948, 1949, right? The Bengali Hindus, right? They were not in numerically in a dominant position in the structure of the govern, government in Assam, I think. And by the time the cultural 
quest for the Assamist modernity, I think that also has taken a big step as I have given a brief idea about that. I think that sense of loss and sense of unhappiness uh, came to be reflected quite often and many a times in the political developments in a later period of time, particularly in the 1960, again in 1970, and in often in many, many times when different kind of political development take place about this loss of because of the, also the Senate story, because Senate now uh, became part of Pakistan and Senate was definitely a massive loss. See, Assam did not want to lose Silat earlier in the 1920s because if Assam want to lose the Silat, it will be a serious disturbance in her economic position because, because of Silat, the, 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 the Indian government, the imperial government's contributions to Assam was much more higher. I think those are critical issues and all those things really destabilized Assam's economy and other things by 1947. I think this high time that we really looked into 47, 48 more critically based on this new affair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, certainly, Muhammad Sadullah was possibly the most astute and uh, far sighted member of the drafting committee. And uh, as I was going through all of the constituent assembly debates uh, during the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act uh, controversy and the movement against it, uh, I found that, in fact, uh, the dissenters uh, were absolutely, uh, you know, brilliant, uh, but in uh, calling for a more democratic and a more federal constitutional uh, arrangement, but practically every amendment which they brought, uh, whether by KT Shah or Haridishno Kamat or uh, Shibanla Saksesna, were negative mm -hmm. uh, because there, there was such a huge, you know, Congress uh, presence. Uh, presence in the Constituent Assembly, and uh, many of the Federalists had left a consequent to the partition, but Sadullah is an interesting character who who remains to mm -hmm. make some of these uh, some of these arguments. And even outside the Constituent Assembly in the late 40s, uh, there were, and even into the late uh, early 50s, there were some uh, very uh, interesting debates uh, with alternative ideas circulating, um, which need to be, I think, uh, revisited because they've become more salient mm. today, uh, as once again, uh, uh, there is a strong impulse towards over-centralization and what the best federal ideas were in the past uh, need to be uh, re-excavated. Mm. But I've said enough, uh, let me uh, uh, ask the audience now uh, to pose questions or make brief comments uh, in response to, uh, to out of Jyoti Saikya's keynote. We do have audience yes. online, so we can take maybe one per one in person and one online question. Sure, Is that absolutely. Okay? Do uh, uh, do bring up the audience uh, online question. So let's have the first question from the audience, and then we'll go to an online question if there's one. And there's Ankur. Um, oh, okay. Online question. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Sekia and Professor Bose and Deputy Professor Sekia for those uh, a great um, keynote and insightful one. I'm sorry. I just Huh? I had, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is not really a question, more like thinking aloud with certain um, uh reflections that i've also had by listening uh to your keynote um one of the interesting part that kind of um stuck out for me was uh when you speak about again when you end and emphasize how 
the definition of AFNIs is always shifting and it's complex and it's contentious. Um, and I was wondering if we can think about it in terms of also the themes of today's uh, conference, which is indigeneity and what, what is an indigenous. Uh, what is in, what does it mean to be indigenous in Northeast India and how particularly in Assam and I, uh, pardon me because I'm as Professor Bose also highlighted that um, at the present moment these questions become far more salient and it seems like um, uh, it seems like this pertinent to also go back to this question of who is an Asmi Asmi without of course looking for strict uh, singular answers but also link it with how that question is now linked with who is an indigenous in Assam, or questions of indigeneity, and also who is a citizen in Assam. So um, if you could help all of us reflect on through your position of a historian, how does, how does one kind of enter those kind of uh, questions, address those kind of uh, questions? And I mean, and I might be wrong, but it seems like the question of Ask me the definition of ask me indigeneity and citizenship uh, in Assam falls um, within the lines of various histories of communities and ethnicities. And since you also spoke uh, so well about the uh, economic history and political history of Assam, one also wonders if uh, looking at the redistribution of economic resources in Assam and that debate itself kind of uh, intersects directly with. Uh, indigenous rights, tribal rights in terms of land and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't know if I'm clear, but these are the... Just introduce yourself. Oh, please. sorry. Um, I'm Lehi. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University in the Department of Anthropology. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting, and I think it's a very uh, challenging question. Let me go back to the 17th or 16th century to answer your question probably in a better way, right? Uh, to answer your questions in the 21st century would be much more difficult for me, right? You know, in the 18th, 16th or the 17th century, my sense, my sense is that every community would be uh, defined in terms of your relations to, to, to the kingdom, right? There would be varieties of and many layers of political kingdoms at the time, right? Much, some were much more powerful, some were much more smaller, right? In terms of their resources, military strength, and in terms of their political visions, right? Uh, within this political uh, uh, schema, uh, if we would see that there would be many ethnic groups. Uh, obviously, they would not consider themselves as ethnic groups. They would consider themselves as belonging to the certain kind of clan, certain kind of communities is speaking different languages, right? And their relations within the political and the bureaucratic structure of the governments of the time, right? But obviously the one, one common and the powerful uh, the strain of the time was the rise of the Assamic literary history. I'm talking about the 16th and the 17th century. The other, his, other communities literary works were there. They are obviously not in forms of uh, written and uh, 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 written uh, forms, but I think that those were the associations. As the centuries progress in the 17th century, in the 18th century, right? I think things are almost almost in a similar fashion and a similar design, right? Uh, you belong to a religious cult, you belong to a religious group, you associate yourself with a particular kind of political affiliation, right? This was how it was evolving. Things obviously began to change in the 19th and the 20th century, right? Things were much more in terms of your uh, language, your stories of your access to the economic resources, your access to the emerging colonial style and colonial design of the governance, right? But I think, and this was also the time when this idea of Assamese, they, it also began to evolve, right? In a in much more cohesive and in a much more stronger way. But there are also the other things, right? You know, see the relations of many hill communities at the time in the early 19th century and the British government. Obviously, uh, those were designed in terms of their access, their relations with the imperial government, the East India Company's relationship over a period of time. But things began to take a coherent, 
contested states towards the end of the 19th century with the strong rise of the Assamese culture and the Assamese imaginations, right? And I think this was also the time when the, when the others also, who obviously did not speak Assamese, who had no relations with the Assamese language, Assamese cultural ethos, emotionally, culturally, and other ways also, but who had different kind of political histories in the 16, 17, or the earlier centuries, they began to position themselves uh, as a distinct political political and ethnic entity, I think. I think it was based on that, the 20th century histories of the indigenity, 20th century histories of the nomenclatures of the ethnic communities began to take shape. I think this is where we need to investigate more. And I would not like to comment on the 21st century because 21st century is beyond my expertise and beyond my uh, domain, right? Is there an online question? Sure. I'll try this very short, very short. If you can manage a summary of the question, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah. um, the person is asking where and how within the politics of the Assamese middle class does the politics of indigeneity feature? What are Assamese leaders thinking about this at the moment? And what are the implications of this in the contemporary political scenario of Assam? Uh, okay, L let's get one more question because uh, Aurup Jyoti has already said that he's uh, uh, not uh, really getting into uh, the 21st century, but uh, let's have one more question and yeah. uh, have a last one. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Milan, and I'm a master's, first year master's student at Delhi University. So I have basically two questions to Professor Saikya. So my first question is, I mean, as you have already highlighted in your speech and that the overarching presence of the SME speaking caste Hindu in political, literary and cultural spheres in the 20th century and its inability or rather hostility in accommodating the multi-ethnic cultural grammar of the region, which resulted in fissures and cleavages, both social and political alike. So this tension between SME nationalism and the myriad of uh, rising subnationalism. So how do you draw the genealogy of this character of Assamese speaking elite. I mean, is Assamese nationalism the one that you have mentioned in your speech? Um, I mean, the one which we can see, I mean, it's genius in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century, a product of colonial modernity, which I mean, Anderson, just Benedict Anderson says that print capitalism or print culture is essential, a product of colonial modernity and also the impact from Bengal Renaissance, which is to imitate the English gentleman image or that of the Bengali Bhadraluk. And uh, is this, uh, I mean, is Ashmasonism a product of this colonial modernity and um, and and the impact of Bengal Renaissance? And is this uh, did this result in uh, inculcating a grassroots detached identity? I mean, becoming, I mean, uh, highlighting Gunabhiram Borua's treatment of tribals in his work, or rather Anandaram Bhikhelpukal speaking that Assam should be a full bari, Habi Gusi full bari habo. So how do we look at the ontology of Assamese nationalism? Okay, I think and, that uh, in the interest of time, yes. we'll have to keep And then uh, that just that my way. second question is very brief. That's how to position history writing, I mean, colonial, I mean, history writing during the colonial time, I mean, especially Kamu Bono Hundan Committee, uh, within, the, within the bigger realm of history writing, do you see them as nationalistic history writing exercise or other than identity uh, exercises of writing history? Okay, yeah. all right, Jyoti, you are I'm really very brief. You know, uh, uh, to trace the genealogy of the Assamese modernity in the 19th century, I would strongly see, and my sense is that Assam obviously appreciated Bengal. They were deeply impressed by the Bengal and the West, but it was equally impressed by its own uh, own past, right? Uh, it did not simply discard what was happening in terms in Assam of the 16th century, in the 17th century. I think it is that classic combinations of both Bengal, West, and Assam com combined together, right? Kamru Ponukhandan Committee's uh, uh, work, I think they were obviously, some of some works are extraordinarily competent work, great work, but it was not nearly antiquarian work, right? And they, this cannot be nearly seen as a nationalist history writing. They were much more deeper and much more complex. 
in fact, uh, I think we have not really done a good work uh, in terms of the work produced by the Congo Pono Fundamental Committee, some of which we can really find in the pages of the uh, the journal of the um, Assam uh, the Assam Research Society. In fact, it is still with serious work. I think. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, when it comes to 21st century questions, I'd be happy to address them when I chair the second substantive session. But uh, uh, for now, uh, let's uh, uh, thank uh, Aurobindo Jyoti Chaitya warmly uh, for his wonderful keynote lecture. Thank you so much, Professor Bose and Professor Aurobindo. So we'll break for tea now. Uh, since we're running late, we'll have a very quick maximum 15 minutes. So we request all of you to be back in the room, possibly by 11:30, but max by 11:35. Thank you for very much. Tea is just served outside. Thank you. Yes. I sent Thank <laughs> you. Hello. Thank you for joining Professor Carlson. We will just quickly have an audio visual check if that's okay.
Good morning, Professor Carlson. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, apologies, you can't see me with the video turned off, but we just have a quick uh, AV check. I can see your video. The video looks good. Um, if you could unmute yourself, we could check the audio as well. Okay, just a moment. We're actually unable to hear you. Just a moment. I'll just check. And I'll get back to you just a moment. Yeah, 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 this whole classroom. Um, we're just checking his mic one. His, his audio is not responsive right now. Okay. Uh, could you test your mic again? We we'll just try. It's still not audible at the moment. Uh, would you have a microphone that you can connect with, perhaps a, a headphone, perhaps that might help? You seem to be unmuted, but the volume's not coming through. It's just do you, is there a difference now? Yes, this is much, much better. We can hear you now. Oh. Lovely. Okay. Somehow I must have changed it. <laughs> yes, this is okay. this so now you Yes, this is perfect. Okay, so great. In another five minutes. We actually oh. ended you know, a little late with Professor Sekia and uh, everyone's having tea at the moment and are coming in. So we'll start in five okay. and uh, okay. we'll have quick introductions in the beginning and each speaker is now going to have 15 minutes as per um, Professor Sekia's instruction. So... Yeah. Uh, what happened with Prof Professor Sandhya Barua? He's not ill, I hope. Uh, he's all right. He, uh, he actually had a quick family emergency to attend to, so he could not fly down. Ooh, so, okay. Really sorry to hear this. Now he's a close friend, so I was sort of getting worried <laughs> or something. Yeah. No, no, okay. he's okay. Uh, he's, he's in good health. He's really hoping to be here, but unfortunately, just so it happened that uh, yesterday he had to actually uh, head out to uh, attend to a family emergency. So, oh. yeah. so is Arku Longkumar his with us now also? Or? Uh, so Arku Longkumar's session is in the next panel. So he'll have a presentation in the next panel and he'll also be joining us virtually. Okay, but he's not, he's not here now or... No, no, he's not here now. So we'll do his audiovisual check uh, two hours after. Uh, okay. Now I just wonder if he has joined, you know, just to, to sit in. No, no, he's not here at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to check, are there any slides that you might be presenting? No, or no, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm just giving a, a, I'm reading out the text, yeah. So, so I don't, there's no, there's no visuals. Yeah, in that case, I think the audio visuals are perfect. We'll just, oh, okay. I will, um, Pooja and I will be giving you, uh, we'll be backstopping you for time. So, okay. uh, when you're around, uh, when you have around five minutes, um, actually two minutes remaining, we'll just give you a heads up on the chat. So, just to keep an eye out for the chat section. I just mute myself now then. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi. I just wanted to check with you before um, you just check your so once you're starting out, just check to um, yeah. So that is and basically you will uh, open this presentation. The presentation is on set. So that should be all of but I'll be around the presentation. Okay. Is it your paper? I'm sorry. Is it your paper? Without further ado, we'll actually quickly start with the second panel. And we'll have Professor Sekia introduce all the speakers. Professor Sekia would be chairing the second session. Uh, and we have Professor Carlson with us, who's joined us online. Uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome back. And let us begin our panel one. As you know, which is entitled as the Bhanikula Politics, Ethnic Sovereignties, and Politics of Heels and Plains. We have three distinguished speakers with us, uh, Professor Guite, Professor Kalchan, and Professor Bilio. They are all three distinguished scholars on this reason. And would you let us spread go into that. How the
Um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bose and the uh, Looking with Those South Asia um, Institute for inviting me to be um, inviting me here today. Um, and also want to thank um, Dr. Cookin and um, the staff at LMSAI for making this happen. Um, Yeah, I can do that. Um, can can people see my screen better? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. So, um, I'll begin my um presentation with a, a poem um by um Mona Zote, a Mizo poet, called "What Poetry Means: Honesty and Pearl." What should poetry mean? to a woman in the hills as she sits one long sloping summer evening in Patria, Isol, her head crammed with contrary winds, pistoling the clever stars that seem to say, ignoring the problem will not make it go away. So what if Anasina is not a name, not even a corruption, less than a monument? She will sit pulling on one thing cigarette after another with her, um, will lift her teacup in a friendly gesture to the hills and the Lacacia stars, and the music will comb onto her hair, telling her, Poetry must be raw like a side of beef, should drip blood and remind you of sweat and dusty slaughter and the epidermal crunch and the sudden bullet to the head, the sudden bullet in the head. Thus she sits calmly scattered. Ernestina seems oblivious to the, the violence, blood and gore around her and most important, importantly, the bullet in her head, like a shell-shocked Septimus Warren Smith in, um, in Wolf, Mrs. Dalloway, who's hallucinated about his friends killed in the First World War, this numb reaction to gun violence is not unique to Ernestina. Almost every person in the Northeastern region has been conditioned to think or feel that this is perfectly normal. My favorite game to play uh, with my cousins growing up in Manipur during the height of the insurgency was Fire, a modified version of hide and seek where you search opposing team members and shoot them down to win the game. About 30 years before this, the ASSCA was implemented on August 18, 1958 in some regions of unified Assam. I coached in 1961, Okro, Mao, Maram, and Tamilong subdivisions were declared to serve under Section 3 of the Armed Forces, Assam, and Manipur Special Powers Act 1958, and the Army took over control of operations from this, uh, in these areas. Unquote. By 1980, the whole state of Manipur was declared disturbed, and the AFSCA was automatically implemented. The entire region of Northeast India has been caught in a vortex of violence, political, economic, social, as well as psychological for more than seven decades, starting from 1940s with the Naga movement in Nagaland, in Manipur from 1949 following the controversial merger agreement, in Mizoram in, in the 1960s and Assam in the 1970s, um, and so on. The socio-political manifestations of militarized violence that the region faces um, have myriad implications at the individual, social, and collective levels. While demand for further balkanization of the eight states rend the air, the bloodbath continues in the form of ethnic violence within different communities in the name of identities and homelands that are yet to come into being. I take up the case of Manipur due to my familiarity with the state and its uniqueness in terms of the contestations that have taken place and are ongoing. Um, I quote um, Sanjeev Barwa. According to one count, Manipur tops the list of militant organizations in the region with 35, Assam is second with 34, Tripura has 30, Nagaland has four, and Meghalaya checks in at three militant organizations. Only Arunachal Pradesh and Mizoram are relatively free from militancy at the moment, unquote. Um, this is a slide from the South Asia terrorist portal. Um, it's available for anyone to go and see. Uh, the Indian government's coin or counterinsurgency strategy has been that of a colonialist and archaic excessive militarization of the region. And therefore, 179,000 security personnel are estimated to be stationed in Manipur at the moment. All kinds of civil and democratic rights remain suspended in the state. Attacks by 
quote unquote, insurgents are retaliators with indiscriminate firing and killing of civilians, including women and children by security forces. Um, the Hirangatong massacre of March 14, 1984, the Malo massacre of November 2, 2000, which led to Shremila's protest, and the recent killing, killing of civilians in Nagaland's Mon district on December 6, 2021, um, to mention a few. These non-combatant casualties are considered collateral damage and therefore numerous cases of crossfire or, or excesses of the armed forces are not examples of abuse, but rather the use of the SSPA. I must point out here though, that the situation seems to have changed for the better in the past few years in Manipur, although one is acutely aware of the ephemeral quality of peace in Manipur. Anything can happen at any time. Protests and dissent against nefarious activities of trigger happy armed forces continue to remain muted by the state. The problems of armed insurgencies, the proliferation of myriad organizations working underground with their limited political vision and objectives that are rather short term and their nefarious connections with the corrupt sections of the administ administration comprises what I describe as the second axis of evil in this context. The third axis is the internecine um, ethno-religious conflict that plagues the region. In Manipur, apart from the Meite slash Valley based insurgent groups, there are at least 13 um, ethno religious minority groups. Um, the actual numbers of the groups um, operating in, 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 in Manipur um, keep, um, and their active and inactive status constantly changes, although the main objective of all the groups is autonomy and secession from the Indian Union, creation of Kanglai Bak for the Meite, Kupi land for the Kupi groups, and Nagalim for the Nagas, and so on and so forth. But what is common with all these groups is that they fund their revolution with violence, extortion, kidnapping, murders, meddling in domestic affairs, and being used as hired guns. If the military, with their special powers of intervention and impunity to rape, torture, and kill, owing to the protection of the draconian, protection of draconian acts like the AFSPA, forms the first axis of evil, the militant insurgency groups, the second, then the third comes out as a fallout of effect in terms of violent ethnic conflict between the Kupis and the Nagas, the Nagas and the Maitis, the Maitis and the Bangles, creating a situation of perpetual in, internal peace that holds the very functioning of the state. Bangles are the, the, the Muslim or Islamic community of Manipur. In such a scenario, demands like, I quote, a political situation has to be found, the process of reconciliation has to begin, unquote, elicited by scholars such as Dasgupta, Ring Hollow, as one fails to understand, sorry, one fails to take into account that it is rather through the will of the state and its institutions that the, the region remains disturbed, its condition of alienation maintained for reasons that are political, economic in nature. What needs to be understood, therefore, is how these three-tiered problems that hold the region on the project of the violence is the result of a ground reality that has not emanated, as some experts seem to suggest, from a misunderstanding of the situation, leading to the mishandling by the leading to mishandling by the center, failed governance or law and order problem, but rather a result of a collusion of interests of the elite and their connections to the government in the center and the parallel, parallel underground government. The oscillation between the terms of reference constructing what seems to be defining logic of the ongoing crisis tenders in one way or the other to the notion of the region being an exotic other. Um, some state, sorry, state institutions can change the terms of discourse altogether if they shift their excessive reliance on what Sanjay Barwa um, describes as, I quote, archaic military solutions and rather facilitate, I quote, transparency in governance and administration, unquote. Um, likewise, um, likewise Oinam Bhagat contends that ethnic conflicts are, I quote, a creation of political necessity and an administrative and administrative convenience, unquote. What he suggests um, in terms of a solution is an alternative model of integration following what Tata proposes in critique of dialectical reason, a constitutive praxis which has to be, I quote, translated in terms of political partic participation, not merely through electoral politics, but involving civil societies and economic development aiming at removing regional imbalances, unquote. Um, with this, I come to the final section of my presentation where I use Kanailao's performances and mental writing to depict a militarized region embroiled in ter political turmoil for seven decades. Um, stories are powerful. Um, and um, um, and Kanhailal and Mentavi's stories are, for me personally, very powerful because the very act of narrating and recording a story becomes a political act. Often, what cannot be expressed in words has been expressed in his, in Kanhailal's performances and her and Mentavi's writings. And the primary aim of their um, um, of their writing is not to entertain, but rather to provoke the audience as well as those in the seat of power. And comic humor in any form is hardly ever used. 
These are excerpts from um, the poem Red Ching Tao by Lin uh, which I'm not going to read, but I will keep it on for people to read. Um, the, in, in this poem, Lin Sawi talked about how the motherland helplessly bear witness to the rape, murder, and plunder of her land. Mother Nature cries tears of blood as she weaves the stories of her dead children into a fabric of nature. History might not record this, but the hills and the veils will remember the atrocities of conflict, right, Lin Sawi? Um, I come to my <clears throat> next slide, uh, where I talk about um, Kanhai Lal's um, performance, Draupadi. Um, this is Malika Sarabai playing Draupadi in Peter Brooks's performance of the Mahabharat. I have this clip especially because I, for no reason other than the fact that I just happen to like um, um, Sarabai's um, work. Um, in direct contrast to the ideal woman, Draupadi, who is protected by dharma, is though be measured a marginalized tribal woman in Mahashwata's short story, Draupadi, written in Bangla and translated English by, English by Sivak. Dopi is disrobed and gang raped. When Dopi is arrested and refuses to talk, the Senanayak orders the subordinates to make her. By giving this order, the Senanayak is given the license to rape and torture Dopi. Using, using, using rape as a strategic weapon of war is not uncommon in on conflict zones, and India is no exception. The next morning, the officers command that Dopi be brought in front of him, and Senanayak walks out surprised and sees Dopi naked, walking towards them in the bright sunlight with her head held high. The torture that was meant to make Dopi talk, to humiliate her, um, um, <laughs> um, um, does not actually um, bake her. She refuses to be broken. Despite Sinanayak and his security men's, before, uh, men's efforts to defeat Dopi's womanhood and identity, she refuses to be victimized um, by rape. She challenges Sinanayak to, quote unquote, counter her. Encounter in this context has been derived from the term encounter. In Indian um, coin parlance, extrajudicial killings or fake encounters are euphemistically referred to as encounters. While most people hailed Savitri's performance as a prophetic imitation of art and life, I argue that this is not a mere case of life imitating art, but rather a representation of the lived reality of a heavily militarized, conflict-driven Manipur. Savitri's anger that explodes on stage is rooted in the excesses committed by the armed forces enabled by acts like the Yatsa. The act of performing on stage is neither that um, Savitri nor Dobdi when she cries her war cry, but thousands of civilians who are victims of gun violence and militarization. And most importantly, Savitri on stage, then Chobi, Samhela, Monazote, and others from the region become an embodiment of the outrage against atrocities around the world and a retelling of rather a documentation of militarized lived experiences that has been silenced for centuries. This is where I was supposed to end my um, presentation, but um, I had to cut off some of my um, um, slides, which I would um, like to um, read out just to give you a context um, of what I've, I had tried to do. Um, since now I have like a couple more minutes. Um, this is a poem called um, Playing with War as if um, Flowers, translation mine, um, where Raghule Sangtim, the poet, talks about the, um, I'll read this out for you. The blood, da the blood dances on, bullets rain like flowers, flowing all over the floor, red blood. The world is in this moment, in this place, in all hearts, playing war as if it were flowers, in this moment with a blooded brush on the darkened wall, walls of life, a sun was sketched. Um, the other poem that I have is. Um, this is um, Isra Noralu talking about the factions, ethnic fa uh, factions as well as ethnic differences between within all the insurgency groups. Um, this is it describes a, a scene where they have come to assassinate uh, a, a faction member, where she talks about um, where she says, "Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition. I've got in my in my sight. There's a kid on his right, clinging to his hand." There's a young woman on his left in her jeans and a blue t-shirt. Pretty. Must be his wife's lucky bugger. Damn, they're going into a shop. There's way too many people. But what the heck, CC enemy? Does it matter if a few get hurt too? When we've got our man, okay, guy, this is for all of, for all the others. And this one is for Nagaland. Nagaland for Christ, remember. Praise the Lord, we've eliminated, eliminated another traitor. Um, with this, I end my presentation. Thank you. To believe, uh, my sense is that as these three papers they are combined together one particular theme, maybe we allow all the speakers to speak first and then we come for the animated discussions. May I now invite uh, Kuite, please?
Guite uh, is a, a very recognized historian. He has published extensively. Initially, he taught in Assam University, then moved to JNU. Now he is again teaching at in at Imphal. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have some sort of short infection. I may not be able to speak uh, much. Mm, but then, uh, Ankur, the organizer being a friend, uh, finally I thought even if I'm not well, I should go there and show my face. Uh, as far as uh, the issue that I want to take up uh, is concerned, uh, it may not be uh, quite uh, fit into the uh, topic that uh, we are proposing today. But then uh, since um, I have worked a little bit on um, Indexing IT, uh, which uh, which is uh, under consideration in the publication for publication, I thought I'll share a little bit of what I understood about uh, Indexing IT or what our um, PMS said vernacularization of Indexing IT uh, as we understood in the context of Northeast India. Uh, you, we always have. Uh, Mm, history and always have limitations as far as uh, contemporary history is concerned. And uh, I heard a lot of questions when keynote was addressed. Mm, but please bear with us that uh, our limitation is to look into this uh, historical perspective of the issue that is uh, being presented. Mm, we all know uh, the kind of uh, uh, history that we have in Northeast India, that when you see the history of Northeast India, something unique, a character is uh, always visible, that uh, we all talk about um, vernacularization, indigenization of any issue that is coming. We talk about vernacularization of politics, democracy, or sometimes we talk about um, Professor Joey is there, uh, domestication of even the new Christian religion, anything that comes to Northeast, being um, uh, people are receptive to ideas, but when they receive ideas, they are making it into their own, which which uh, which really doesn't um, uh, looks like its original. And that is something very typical. Uh, what is the uniqueness of ideas, which is. Uh, visible when you see historically. The same thing happens uh, when you talk about uh, indigenous people or indigenity as a concept. Uh, so when it comes to vernacularization of uh, indigenity, uh, I see in terms of how ethnic uh, sovereignty or whatever the terms that we talk about, how every community claims to be a sovereign and how they claim this sovereignty and, and, and so on. Uh, which I want to connect this into the sort of what Billy has also talked about, conflict. Conflict is something which uh, we are very fond of when we talk about history of uh, Northeast India. Uh, my studies look into uh, kind of conflicts that one see since the 1990s. The conflict uh, which we often talk in terms of ethnic uh, class, ethnic uh, fear, ethnic conflicts between different communities, which shows something very different from what it used to be earlier. Uh, and, and, and the conflict since the 1990s, uh, which we already see is violent in character, 
And it is not only violent intellectual, but also a conflict which is taking particular, uh, particular, particular, you know, uh, methods of uh, what you may call as cleansing, ethnic cleansing movement. That is there. Uh, Delhi have also already mentioned what is happening in uh, Manipur between Kokis, Naga, Metei, and Metei Pangas. You have all see all this process of a uh, violent move and ethnic violent class as it happened in Kalbiang Long, in North Kassar Hill, um, uh, even, even, even in Mizoram. And um, uh, not to forget about the Valley of Assam, Brahmaputra Valley. So these, these issues of conflict take us to a very interesting uh, discourse of uh, what we understood as indigenity discourse. That we know that uh, from the modern concept of indigenity came um, a little late uh, since the declaration of indigenous peoples uh, uh, in, in the United Nations in 2007. But then a uh, debate on uh, indigenity or indigenous people has been already there since after independence. Uh, if not, this term is. Mm, uh, to to replace the colonial categories of tribes and mm, uh, primitive people and so on. Uh, this uh, new category uh, is certainly to somehow mm, admonize or ridicule the old uh, colonial terms, is as, as we all understood it to be mm, derogatory and so on. Uh, while scholars are debating on the issue of indigenity, the relevance of indigenity to different social and cultural contexts, we already see an interesting aspect of how this has been understood in the context of Northeast India. Professor Saiki, I have already talked about how people uh, basically go to history. History becomes um, the, the, the central point uh, of defining uh, who is indigenous people of a particular territory. And that is what we see in the context of Assam. And um, the fact that uh, if you go to um, other part of Northeast India, where every community began to rewrite their history uh, uh, in, in, in conformity with the concept of indigenity. That is something very, very clearly visible when we see the indigenity discourse in, in, in public and also in uh, different historical textbooks. Uh, we have had uh, um, issues of um, what we call as Asian controversy when we talk about indigenity concept, uh, where many of these Asian countries have uh, been uh, not kindly to the new concept, which has been coming up in the international uh, legal uh, um, um, framework, we see uh, this as something of a sure water theory, where many of these Asian countries say that no, we we, we sign it uh, with the understanding that uh, it doesn't apply to us here, right? So that is uh, uh, what we see. But then, uh, when when this is going on, when this debate is going on. Uh, in, in different parts of the globe, uh, we can see that many tribal rights groups came up and start insisting their government to adopt um, the new law, the new international instrument. Uh, in India, we see uh, this has been uh, one of the uh, points, one of the issues which many tribal groups are um, fighting for. Uh, even we see from in 2011, Supreme Court have um, a landmark verdict on saying that tribal people or shadow tribes or Adivasi uh, are the, uh, the original inhabitants of India, original inhabitants of India, right? Which, in a way, although the term indigenous was not used, um, uh, recognize Adivasis, which scholars usually understood as indigenous people of India, are uh, indigenous to India. When it comes to um, Northeast in a densely contested situation in India's Northeast, 
we can see um, another interesting version of um, indigenous discourse, uh, which had triggered a new debate on identity and ethnicity, and also a new level of uh, ethnic conflict involving violent ethnic cleansing or pardon movement. Here, the essential criterion of uh, a history, or what is known as the first come doctrine, was given due preference over other criteria. Uh, if it is always difficult to prove who came first in a particular land or territory, it insisted that the one who arrived first into a given territory uh, is understood to be indigenous people. And by this token, felt entitled to exclusive rights over land, territory, and resources for which they sought to protect or protect them by the state. And on the other hand, those who came later after them are marked out to be settlers, outsiders, uh, refugees, uh, and, and, and declare them to be not indigenous people of a particular um, territory and who accordingly have no rights over the land and resources of the territory. So in the context of Northeast and also India, it being tribal empowers indigenity, every tribal community based on the colonial category of tribe and race insisted that they were the ones who arrived first uh, before the others and hence claim for an exclusive ownership and sovereignty over the land and resources. So indigenity has become the legal and ideological basis of an exclusive claim of communities' ownership and sovereignty over land and resources in the context of Northeast India. And this is particularly uh, the unique um, um, way in which indigenity has been understood, uh, which is, as we all know, it's quite different from the modern conception of uh, indigenity or indigenous people. Uh, where I already said that uh, many of these communities begin with production of um, history, not history, history, uh, which uh, often challenge the objective existence of the past. Uh, this vernacular version of indigenity in Nordic India is uh, what um, I call in my paper as Assam controversy. Uh, it has become the basis of claims and actions and has successfully generated new debate on the identity and ethnicity, and also um, a new level of uh, conflict. As I already said, the post-1990 ethnic relations in India's Northeast shows how the new concept of indigenity has exacerbated a new level of ethnic tension and conflict in the region that involves, besides other methods, what can be known as ethnic cleansing movement. Uh, my general argument is that um, the new concept of indigenity received uh, new vernacular meaning and interpretation in the Northeast India, which had assumed not only the legal and ideological basis of various ethnic movements, but also exacerbated ethnic tensions and conflicts to another level. There are some controversy assume a new modality of indigenity discourse. I may claim it as specific to the region's vernacular politics and representation. And this modality applies both to the hills and the plants, and perhaps interrogate the colonial region of hill valley divide and tribal non-tribal divide. Uh, I'll stop here. Mm. Uh, we may, I may continue the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goethe. Goethe has given us a very interesting idea about the conceptual framework in which we can understand the questions of indigenity in the Northeastern India. Thank you, Goethe. We'll wait for the discussion at a later period. Um, our the last speaker of the panel, Professor Kalchan. Uh, Kalchan, we are all familiar with his work, his unruly uh, hills, unruly hills to the recent work, right? Uh, he teaches at uh, Stockholm University. He is joining us online. Uh, it must be an early morning. Perfect welcome to you. Right? Uh, and, and, okay. It must be very cold in your place also. Okay. Kalchan, to you. Sure. <clears throat> so, yeah.
Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure, this is early morning and this is, yeah, it's winter is going on. So thanks a lot for the kind invitation to take part in this really important and timely event to take stock of the present politics of the indigeneity in Northeast India. And, and, and thanks for, to Professor Bose for the, for the introduction and also to Professor Saike for this uh, really enlightening uh, lecture or a keynote on, on you know, what was going on in the 1950s. And I think you know, that is really relevant to think about you know, when we try to locate sort of the emergence of say the movements that then ultimately led to the sort of the partition of Assam. Um, I mean, where, where do we locate this, you know, and where, where, where is the driving forces for, for, for those processes that then later on you know, have been translated into sort of indigenous issues. And I'm thinking here, you know, is it sort of things that is happening in Assam, you know, the core areas of Assam that, you know, Professor Saki was talking about, or is it rather issues that are happening from the center, which is something our friend and colleague Sandy who who's unfortunately not with us. But I mean, he's sort of tend to argue more in favor of, of that a lot of the division comes from um, sort of issues, decisions taken in, in Delhi rather than, you know, things that are emerging. As some say, for example, the, the declaration of our Sandinist is the, is the state language. Anyway, so this is, is sort of a very, very nice conversation. And thanks also to my fellow panelists, really interesting. Uh, so, um, of course, I've been sort of on and off been thinking and writing about the topic of indigenous peoples uh, from, from more than two decades now. And I hope you allow me to begin this short intervention by returning to my first attempt as writing about indigeneity. And this is an article that was published in 2001. I'm getting old now, so, so sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so, so it's an article um, that I wrote in 2001 in a journal called Identities. And the paper is entitled Indigenous Politics, Community Formation and Indigenous People's Struggle for Self-Determination in Northeast India. And I closed the article by making three rather bold assertions, what I call the uh, propositions and I thought that these can function as a kind of baseline to think about how things have evolved since the turn of the new millennium. Normally, I tend to dislike people that cite their earlier work, but I hope you will excuse me for doing this one time. Yeah. This is not to so, so suggest that this piece in any way still stands out. Others have indeed much, uh, made much more insightful elaborations on indigeneity since then. But for good or bad, it is me speaking now. <clears throat> So, but let me first just flag that talking and writing about indigenous issues as a non-indigenous uh, person or scholar, uh, and one is, of course, I'm neither from the, the region of Northeast India. I think this is fraught with difficulties and contentions. And as a scholar, I've always, I've always been aware of this. I mean, coming into the age uh, as an anthropologist, during a period when my field then, you know, my, the anthropology was haunted by its colonial legacy and accused uh, by people like Edward Said for Orientalism. And, and so, so and, and more recently, these concerns have come back through calls for decolonizing of research. And in the case, in the case of indigenous studies, concerns for new indigenous methodologies. And I think for all of us engaged with indigenous issues, of course, our positionality, um, you know, what, um, um, you know, when to speak, what to speak of, and how to speak about things. These are serious issues that we have to engage with, with, with uh, all the time. And there are certainly issues that are better left for indigenous scholars to work out for themselves. Pursuing what Maori scholar Linda Zoe uh, Smith referred to as sort of an indigenous research agenda. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this when I sort of uh, speak about uh, the topic of today's conference. And I think there are uh, cases where I at least feel that uh, as an outsider, one should sort of rather step aside. And I'm thinking here about, you know, the really important work um, that my friends uh, Dolly Kikon and, and Arko Tom Dunkumar is working on this project about ancestral Naga humans, uh, human remains project, but they're trying to bring back objects from the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford University to the concerned Naga communities um, 
in Nagaland. And of course, this is a really highly sensitive venture, a complex matter of societal healing to complete the unfinished business of decolonization. And, you know, this will ultimately stir up strong emotions in effect. And as I learned from Dolly, you know, talking about these things, you know, they, have, they are now consulting elders from Aboriginal communities in Australia who have gone through a similar process of societal healing in return. And I think this is, could just be an example of the type of things that uh, you know, we as you know, an outside scholar should really step aside and sort of allow others to, to speak and, and, and sort of keep a respectful distance to this type of process. But I also feel that this is a very, very fine, you know, at times it's a very fine line to walk. You cannot always tell when you're crossing the boundary, the boundary and overstepping your mandate as an outside scholar. And I think this is perhaps something that we will discuss further in the, in the seminar today. But then let me go back then to this um, 2001 article and the three propositions that I sort of launched there. And sorry again for a long quote here, so I'm quoting. Firstly, the concept indigenous peoples is clearly a political fact in India today. Tribal communities increasingly identify and mobilize as indigenous peoples or as Adivasis to claim rights over land and resources. <clears throat> the global discourse on indigenousness apparently resonates with or captures central features of tribal predicaments and aspirations. Academic, academic interrogations of the concept indigenous peoples that do not acknowledge or account for this fact are simply obsolete. Secondly, the transnational discourse on indigenousness is intrinsically linked to the right of self-determination. Both supporters and antagonists of the usage of the term indigenous peoples in India seems to agree, to agree that the term empowers or legitimates autonomy movements like that of Bodos or the Nagas. Depending, of course, how one views such movements, this is either regarded as a good or a bad thing. Thirdly, with the opening, of, opening up of a new political space of the indigenous, participating in organizations or networks on regional, national, or transnational level will lead to new forms of community mobilization and ways of envisioning or imagining collective selves that are bound to develop. So, end of quote. So, Getting older now, I'm sort of getting, and of course, getting more cautious. I'm sort of a bit surprised about the boldness of these or straightforwardness of these propositions. And I think um, it's still, I still find it valid to think about this as we now re sort of return to and think about what has happened since this was sort of what was formulated in the late 1990s. And then think about how, you know, this then, uh, speaks to the contemporary situation. And I think, so then, what we've seen during the last couple of years are a proliferation of claims to indigeneity. I mean, the term indigenous peoples are indeed out in the streets, used in various contexts by both scholars and groups who self-identify as such. What is new, it seems to me, is how people from non-tribal communities or majority populations now also assert themselves as indigenous. Uh, and again, you know, I mentioned earlier Arkoton Gunkumar, but he gives a telling example of this in his superb book, The Greater Indian Experiment, the Hindutva in the Northeast that came out uh, last year. So in the book, he shows how RSS activists have appropriated tropes otherwise isolated with indigenous peoples, like, you know, the closest, closeness to nature or to Mother Earth, and how this is used in claiming indigenous religions as part of the larger Hindu family. As he puts it, this is, a this is challenging because Hindutva makes universal claims about indigeneity, even going so far as to use UN, United Nations discourse of, of indigenous peoples. And he asks, what happens when dominance, not marginality, enters the discourse of indigeneity? And in the in in epilogue of the book, Longcomer rephrases the question, and I quote, what will happen to indigenous peoples and their movements if their voices are constantly undermined by dominant groups whose population not only exceeds them, but whose livelihoods depend precisely on the lands belonging to indigenous peoples? I think this is really central to end of quote. And I think this is a really uh, central question. And I hope that, you know, uh, 
Professor Lonkomer will be addressing this in his presentation later. I mean, this is the next session, I think, after lunch. <clears throat> and as I recall, 2000, this was reflected in the conference that I was part of organizing in Uppsala in the year 2000, that later was published, part of some of the, the, the presentations that were published in the book that I edited with Professor Tanka Surba called Indigenity in India. Uh, but then, you know, as I said, you know, so late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there had sort of sprung up new uh, organizations and sort of regional networks that was connecting up with, with you know, the, the UN Working Group of Indigenous Populations. So this was, uh, that later on became, the, you know, you know the, the permanent forum that is now hosted in New York by the United Nations. And here, so, so there were, you know, really something happening there. You know, new organizations came up using the term indigenous peoples, starting to build sort of both a regional networks like in the case of Northeast, but also in, in sort of larger Indian networks. And I think in these discussions, uh, and this was uh, expressed most clearly by Professor Ram Dayal Munda, who was one of the sort of central figures in the national platform for indigenous peoples. And he said then from the beginning, and he was also part of that Uppsala conference, and he stated really clearly that let us to begin with say that the indigenous peoples in India are the scheduled tribes. And he said that, okay, we take that as a starting point, and then we'll later on, we, the indigenous peoples ourselves, will work out who should be sort of uh, um, rec recognized as, as, as indigenous peoples. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and again, you know, very clearly that if the scheduled tribe framework is something that is worked by, by the government, by the state institutions, you know, the indigenous people's framework, you know, should be worked out by the people themselves. You know? So it's not a state uh, concept as such. It's, it's something that supposedly should be based on self-identification self by and something that would be worked out by these organizations themselves. And I think thinking back to these moments, I, I think, I mean, if I, then I, I think this was, I was expecting this process to get, to gain momentum and, and that uh, today, you know, like 20 years later, we would have some kind of general protocol uh, for, you know, who should then, you know, be able to claim that slot of, of being indigenous. And I think, you know, as I suggested earlier, this has not really happened. You know, instead, we have a large uh, uh, plethora of groups now claiming rights and, 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 and Tribes as indigenous peoples. And, and Dr. Arki de Barma gives in his entry on, on the indigeneity in this recent, uh, very interesting uh, Rutledge companion to Northeast India, give another example of you know, non tribal or sort of dominant groups claiming indigenous nest. It's an organization I don't know about, but it's called Kil Kilonia Manch or Indigenous Forums of Assam, who assert that all those that lived in uh, Assam prior to the Treaty of Yandabu in 1826 should be regarded as, as indigenous. So this conflation of sons of the soil claims by the majority groups with that of marginalized tribal com com communities naturally undermines the polit political currency of indigenousness or indigenous associations. And again, point to the urgency of interrogating the new pathways of, of that we are doing at this conference. Again, you know, it's a very, very important uh, to do this at this particular uh, juncture. For me, in my present work, I have become less interested in the matter of, in matters of identity and also in the politics of indigenous identity. Along with my friends and colleagues, Anya Barbara and Dolly Kikon and others in our food sovereignty team, we are instead looking at indigeneity as a lived practice, what people do, and the basic premise of this uh, joint research project is that farming and food crops have become an important avenue for post-conflict resolution and settlement. Hence, demands for sovereignty and, and indigeneity begin to shift from homelands and territory to how you live on the land, what you grow, what you eat, and the relations you maintain. To be sovereign, you need to be able to feed yourself as one of the slogans of the food sovereignty movement goes. And this is also, so as I suggest also in another article with a, a friend, Nata Valong, it's an article on Meghalaya that was published in this edited book called Vernacular Politics in Northeast India. 
by, uh, added by yellow voters. That we argue that this turn can be theorized as a kind of alter politics, refusal to take part in the aggressive resource extraction that has dominated much of Meghalaya's post-colonial history. In this refusal, indigenous activists protest against the violation of the ban on coal mining in Meghalaya, as well as against attempts by male chauvinist organizations to control women's bodies, you know, seeking to introduce new, this new bill that said, you know, if, if, a, if a Kasi woman marry an outsider, she will lose her sort of tribal uh, membership or, or, or uh, no longer be regarded as her offspring as well. So in this, uh, um, we see flickers of another way of inhabiting the earth. Women enacting what seen Daudi in this in his chapter in, in this vernacular uh, book referred to as counter sovereignty. So in our conversations, you know, in the Food Sovereignty Project, in our conversations with the subsistence farmers, many of whom are women, they have often been told that they want to hold on to their own indigenous heirloom seeds inherited from the landers, rather than buying improved seed varieties from the market. This, they tell us, is because they know their traditional seeds. It is through these practices of knowing and caring for seeds that we in the Food Sovereignty Project trace new ways of being and becoming indigenous in the 21st century. So returning then to the three propositions that I mentioned initially, to conclude then, I would say that the notion of indigenous peoples is out there, widely used today, and has nothing, so, has not something one can wish away. For most people that identify as such, claim such and claim recognition and rights as indigenous, uh, it is still a matter of being able to govern oneself and, co and create conditions for a livable collective future. If in the late 1990s, such concerns commonly revolve around claimed territories and rights to natural resources within such homelands. Today, other aspects of indigenous sovereignty are coming to the fore. Aspects that arguably have more to do with how one inhabits or lives on the land. Thank you. I am there. <laughs> Thanks. something with the sound. I uh, Professor Carlson, did you say something? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, now, sorry. <laughs> you know, how does one understand these questions of indignity and where is the question mm -hmm. of resource? Where is this question of time frame and where is how this question of vernacular politics comes in, right? You know, I begin with a very small story. You know, the geological foundation of the Northeastern India is quite peculiar. When I talk about the geological foundation, I talk about the history of the millions of years and when uh, on an oceanic foundation, the hill rolls, right? And on those hills, because as you all know, as we all know, the oceans are the great source for the rock, the salts, right? And you know, the Northeastern Hills, uh, they are also the great suppliers of rock salt over a long period of time. When from this ocean, the Northeastern Hills immersed millions of years, the Northeastern Hills, it also became the reservoirs of rock salt in the last probably a thousand years or a little bit of more, this rock salt, uh, which was lying inside those oceanic foundation of the Northeastern Hills, right? They became a very crucial component in, to define the relationship between the political kingdoms, between relationship between the hills and the plains. And this is how the, 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 the relationship of different kinds of political kingdoms they immersed over a, or, or on that reasons over a long period of time. 
And as Professor Carlson has shown in very interesting ways about the questions of food sovereignty, right? That reason also evolved different kinds of mechanisms to speak to the plants, to speak to the insects, to speak to the different kinds of non-humans, right? And this is how the, the relations, the ideas of indigenities emerged over a long period of time. The classic examples would be the silkworms, right? The, the silkworm, the silk, the tex, uh, the textiles, the plants, the trades, and other things. However, quite interesting, that reasons uh, remain largely outside of the complex. It was deeply connected with the uh, the Indian subcontinent trade and commercial world, but it was definitely away from the language of that you need to speak to the plants, you need to speak to the insects, you need to speak to the timbers, you need to speak to the rock salt. Those are the different kind of languages and, and that gave a different kind of his histories of indigenity for that region. My speakers, they have definitely talked about these issues. They spoke about the way the questions of political resistance have taken shape in the, the world of literature, both in English and in the vernacular, in the Indian languages of that part of the India, right? Uh, uh, Dr. Guite also talked about the probability and the possibilities of uh, thinking about the different framework of, of indigenity and indigenousness, right? In that region, Dr. Carlson talks about uh, the need for thinking, the questions of food, questions of associations with different kinds of symbols and emotions while we talk about these histories of uh, indigenous and indigenity in that region. I definitely enjoyed the entire panel. Uh, I'm sure you have all of all of you have interesting questions. I have I'll have one question for Dr. Bailey, right? And then I'll open up for all of you, right? Uh, I really enjoyed listening to the, those poets, which convey this message of anger and uh, unhappiness, right? This whole idea of the resistance, whole idea of hostility, terrorization in that region, which began in the 1950s. They are essentially the legacies of the Second World War, right? Uh, those of who, who are un, little unaware of this fact, the Second World War that was fought in the 19, early 1940s in the hills of Manipur, Nagaland, I think that has been recently voted as one of the greatest war that was fought in the world by uh, 2013, in the 2013 by the, uh, in London, right? But anyway, that war left behind the legacies of militarization of that region uh, in, for, in, in different ways. And the evolution of that region in the 40s particularly, you know, in the 40s, uh, that region was visualized seen by the British administrators that they should be separated from India and it should be marched with uh, Western part of Burma and should be governed and administered in a different way like that of modern Hong Kong. But obviously that plan fall apart, right? It didn't work out. But that those anxieties and the, the political troubles of the 1940s obviously created all this future crisis and future situations a few sort of histories of the 50s, 60s, 70s, as all my three panelists have spoken out. I need, I'm really interested to know one thing. You know, English is definitely a very powerful language in the hills of the southeastern India, right? And as we see an emerging very powerful genealogy of English writers in that region, and many of them have essentially has appropriated English as a language of resistance, as a language of uh, contestation about other kinds of discourses about that region. I'm curious because I don't know the lang other languages of uh, that are spoken in say in Manipur, in Nagaland, in Mizoram, right? If you can tell us something more about those vernacular literary words, not the English per se, because some of you have translated, if you can share those uh, experiences, that will be probably quite an interesting way to understand the history of indigenity as it's spoken in non-English languages of that region, right? Thank you. Um, thank you for that um, question. Oh, okay. Uh, for the question, uh, Professor Kasagia. Um, the, um, al although like a lot of the, the writings um, in the Northeast is happening in English, um, 
the I specifically picked up Nimchobi and um, Ganayalal because these uh, Nimchobi writes uh, exclusively in Manipuri, um, and a lot of um, works. I, mean, I I have access to Manipuri, but then I don't have access to other vernacular languages in the Northeast, so um, I cannot speak to that. But um, there are um, I think it was um, there are a lot of translations of um, of Bengali works into Manipuri, and my mom is a profuse reader, so I've seen her read like all kinds of works um, in Manipuri. So, um, but in terms of like translations from Manipuri to English, we're I'm trying to do like a I'm, I'm with a project with some young scholars in Manipur where we're like um, gathering um, specifically poetry of conflict exclusively written in Manipuri to be translated into uh, into English. Um, and so coming back to Kanhela, um, Kanhela, his theater is very interesting. Um, he it's, a, it's an experimental form of theater where um, he believes that an actor needs to have um, a, a retraining by going back to your spontaneous. So um, he talks about how a child's first response is cry, uh, is, a, is a cry, and a cry is a resistance. It's the child telling us that I am hungry, I am, you know, I have peed, or you know, I am cold. So he tries to bring back his actors into such a in, into a kind of a training where they go back to the spontaneous, to the instinctive, and um, and 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 very interestingly, Draupadi was performed in three languages. There was, there is a, um, so um, um, the performances that I've seen, I've, I've not seen the 2000 performances, but any, all of the performances that I've seen of the property had, um, um, had actors from the Rabha community, they spoke in Rabha. People from Manipur um, spoke in Manipuri or whatever language they were comfortable with. There were Bang, uh, Bengali actors who would speak in Bangla. So the lines they would just recite in, um, uh, in, in whatever language that is your mother tongue, because that's the most where you're most comfortable and that's where you act the best. Um, and um, um, I mean, it's not even the, uh, the, the the he does not even write a he does not even have a performance text for the play Draupadi. It's all a, a translation from the Bangla directly into Manipuri, Rabha, and whatever it is that the, the actors mother tongues are. Um, um, yeah. I think this is quite fascinating. The the theater as a symbol of resistance and theater as an experience of indigeneity in that that, that region. I think it it has many stories to tell, and I'm sure we'll have further discussion on that. We have roughly around 35 minutes, 30 35 minutes, and I'm sure all of you have questions for my three distinguished panelists. Right? Thank you. Okay. 2020. Uh, we'll take one by one. Yes, that is, yes, madam. Please introduce yourself and please very quick in your questions. Right, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Bibasha Rosi Lakra. Uh, so my question is for uh, Professor Carlson. Uh, so Professor Carlson, uh, we see that India has its own conceptual development of this idea of tribe and this Western or international term of indigenous people is not acceptable, uh, you know, here by the government of India. So, but in a similar sense, there is this term Adivasi, that is meaning original inhabitants of India, uh, you know, in place of the earlier term Adim Jati, which tribes as, you know, tribes as primitive people. So, this term Adivasi is popular in large parts of India and in Northeast India, it is abhorred for political reasons precisely. That is the presence of the migrant Adivasi settlers, uh, you know, uh, in connection to Assam, who are disliked largely as migrant uh, encroachers. So, here, uh, however, the term tribe is appropriated for self-esteem in the same sense. So I would just like to understand, you know, how do we understand, uh, uh, say, the idea of uh, Adivasi indigeneity, specifically to do with Assam. Uh, you know, also given uh, my PhD uh, fieldwork in Assam, what I understood was largely in the upper parts, I mean, like in the upper Assam and the lower uh, Assam region, is how, uh, you know, people, specifically the ethnic people, they liked largely to be associated as, uh, say, uh, tribal people or scheduled tribes rather than being called as Adivasis. Uh, I'm talking about, say, the Boros or, uh, you know, the other tribal communities in Assam. Right. Thank you. Shall I respond to it? Is your question direct to Professor Carlson? No question? Yes, if your question is directed to Professor Carlson. Uh, uh, thank you for this wonder, wonderful session. Uh, 
my name is ramzan and i am working on the uh, communities of andaman and nicobar island and my question is to uh, professor gote and the uh, professor carlson uh, that in the post colonial in, uh, colonial and post colonial colonial context the marker of identity and politics of recognition provided by the states is tribes but in the international arena the idea of indigeneity try to mold the this uh, all the communities that comes under so called primitive category uh, how do you think the how do you think that the idea of indigeneity or this category can represent a diverse cultural people and their uh, form of their exploitation who are different in each aspect of their culture and their uh, exploitation level professor kalsan would you like to respond first <laughs> okay thanks yeah um, yeah i think more directly perhaps the second if i take the first question and then perhaps leave the, the second one to professor gute no i think in the the the, the issue about um, you know the sort of adivasi the tigon laborers in in assam if of course is a very critical one and i think actually the the piece that i was referring to you know the 2001 article that i referred to actually starts with a discussion about you know the conflict between santal and bodo in the, in the late 1990s and i think this is extremely unfortunate and this is again something that i was expecting then you know at the time of writing that article that by now there would be that kind of sort of um, that you just to think about it, some kind of a protocol where you know things like that would be able to work out i think it's very unfortunate you know that type of conflicts because again you know the the particular history of the tigan laborers of course have to be bear in mind you know when you think about you know the rights of these communities but i think you know why why the term adivasi it is so strongly connected to the people from central um, central india so of course for a lot of the hill people it doesn't really resonate so that's why sort of I mean, a lot of people in the hills would prefer either sort of tribe or not you know, directly to indigenous peoples whereas the adivasi one is found to be more sort of an ethnic identity in the, in, in the northeastern context so i don't know i mean i think this is how you know my take on whole indigenous people issue is that people take things that resonate and run with them, you know, for their own purposes uh, so i it's that's why you know the adivasi thing doesn't really resonate in that way with with, with the hill the people in the hills so i think that's the reason but i think again you know the i would really really hope and i think this is sort of i mean again you know i think it's a really urgent issue for the for for the north east to work out some kind of a solution about you know the rights of the the, 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 the adivasis of the you know the on laborers and how to re respect and recognize their particular situation uh, so i think that's it's not a good answer here but i'm just sort of thinking about that as as still being a very critical issue to work out you know because of course these people the, these communities are recognized as indigenous radivasis in central india that i think that somehow should also be respected and found some kind of a solution how that can be done translate in the context of assam yeah so i think i, I stop that and leave the second question to to my colleague uh, professor gurte uh -huh. Sankar, uh, I don't really get your question. Could you repeat the second one? Your, if, if you can briefly summarize your question. Uh, uh, my question is, that, uh, how do you think that the idea of indigeneity or this category can represent a diverse uh, cultural people and their form of exploitation throughout, this, throughout the history who are different in different to each other in all the cultural aspect mainly in the in a, a unilinear category of indigenous uh i think uh professor karsan uh, may be better to answer that otherwise uh, as he said um, uh, my understanding is uh, tribal category or indigenous category is all about the same Uh, one as being a uh, colonial category, and we just now been uh, somehow uh, intend to replace with another category, 
by uh, the sort of uh, uh, new, new, new liberal world. Uh, just as we see in the context of uh, uh, tribal, tribal become a category uh, to protect, uh, preserve, or uh, 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 to to understand about a particular group of people whom civilizationally understood to be big world and 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 uh, economically uh, um, poor and so on and so forth. So when 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 we use the term indigeneity, it almost applies. Uh, to the same. It is just the changing of the terminology didn't uh, somehow you are trying to mm, 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 sanitize the kind of uh, what we often think derogatory in the context of uh, tribal or tribal people or which have uh, direct connection with the primitive vision and all this backwardness. Uh, otherwise, uh, that is my understanding. I'm sure there are other questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Shubari Pukan. I'm an associate professor at the Delhi University College. I have two questions, very brief ones. Uh, one, the first one is for Dr. Guarino. And uh, my this is my question. Uh, you spoke about you know violence being inscribed on women's bodies. Uh, and you speak uh, primarily in terms of theater, but given there's a lot of narrativization of history in the writing, writing from the Northeast, uh, do you see a shift from a victim trope to one of resistance in literature very, very consistently done, especially by women writers? Uh, and the second question is to Dr. Guete, uh, is that I think you briefly uh, touch upon how conflict has become uh, you know more internal uh, and so do you see a shift from you know a, a kind of a resistance towards the nation state okay uh, towards the mainland and now conflict becoming more localized more uh, you know more uh, uh, you know uh, against each other uh, so if you could expand a little bit on that and also uh, 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 also when we, uh, we're talking about the term indigenous and, uh, you know, do you see that more as uh, the less uh, as an ideological political question, but more as a, an issue that is about actually about the fight for resources, given how limited resources are in the Northeast? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I have to say that um, women and children are the first casualty in any conflict. Um, um, and um, like um, violence and conflict is also very, very gendered. Um, uh, there is also, uh, and, and also like when um, uh, Cynthia Cockburn talks about how like there is a feminization of, of men in conflict where men are also, when men are abused, tortured, or, or especially when they're sexually abused. But to come to your question, um, not necessarily. I've seen that like Kanaila, for example, is uh, he's a male playwright. He talks he talks about conflict, um, not just on and, and not just on, like conflict that is with, with, um, not just on women and women's resistance, but he talks about it. Um, um, I mean, he 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 writes he he his performances um, 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 depict um, conflict in general, and and a lot of the playwrights. At least in Manipur, um, are it, it's uh, like theater is still a very male-dominated um, um, industry in Manipur. We have a, a couple of female playwrights, and um, when the country, like when when the region is at war, and when you have the AFSCA, the the main themes that seem to emerge in 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 performances also has to do with in some way or the other with 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 conflict. So. Um, um, like um, one of the poems, one of the poems that I read out, Raghu Lehrankim's poem, um, uh, it's about conflict. He, he's, he's a male um, poet. Um, and there are like some amazing work, um, all written in Manipuri, um, which talks on conflict. So probably that's why they are not so, um, what do you call it? Um, they're not so known to the outside world. I think when it comes to poets um, and 
from Manipur. I think people usually know Robin Yangam, and that's about it. He, he writes beautifully about conflict. Um, it's I know it's weird to say that in the same sentence, but that's what he does. So, um, um, yes, there are a lot of um, a lot more voices um, when it's um, from women writers talking about women's voices, and I do a lot of like work on on that specifically. Um, but I would not say it's it's, it's like you know a female writer immediate like it's it's all I think. Uh, the first question, how conflict conflict uh, uh, turn internal, right? But this is exactly uh, uh, what I actually try to put into. When you see uh, history of conflict and violence uh, in the context of Northeast, in post-colonial, uh, immediately after India's independence, the conflict and violence uh, was between state and non-state um, actors, uh, what do you call it, insurgent groups, uh, supported by people and so on. Uh, but the trend of this violent uh, uh, somehow uh, sieve, uh, if not uh, the earlier trend um, is completely uh, diminishing, uh, shift from uh, uh, one community to another community. And uh, this, this doesn't mean that there was no conflict at all before, but then the conflict that we see earlier in pre-1990s uh, was not so much of um, uh, ethnic class, violent, um, or ethnic cleansing kind of movement, but uh, something that we, can see from the 1990s, when you see all this um, ethnic conflict, uh, either in the context of Manipur or of in Assam, in, in, in uh, wherever you find all this ethnic conflict between um, two or more communities, uh, one thing invariably uh, become uh, 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 peculiar to each of these was that the dominant community would and even even the minority community would always assert for cleansing the other group from the area which they claim as their territory, ancestral territory, and which uh, eventually become a part of their um, territorial claims, uh, be it for their kind of sovereignty or of statehood or even um, other other uh, sort of uh, claim within the constitution of India. So this, uh, this conflict, which is taking into a uh, completely different uh, uh, level uh, as compared to earlier one, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, re deeply connected to the idea of indigeneity, uh, where uh, when you read all these press pre statements, memorandums, and so on, of all these movements, different communities, um, they all talk about uh, indigenity. They all talk about, assert about their own indigenity and mark out the others, right? Mark out the others as non indigenous people of the territory and trying to justify their accent, not only claims, their accents against the other communities on the basis of this, being the indigenous people of uh, the territory, they seem to have now an ex exclusive rights over the land, rights over the resource, and, and mm, mm, rights over the, uh, uh, the whole political uh, resources of the territory. So this is something which uh, I, I see it very mm, uh, uh, significant as far as conflict is concerned. And from the narrative of all this movement, which we don't see in the 1950s, 60s, uh, is everyone begin to speak in terms of mm, being indigenous of the land, and as if indigenity concept is now giving them the legal and ideological basis for their movement. So uh, this shifting is one. Uh, on the 
second question that you're talking about whether this indigeneity is ideological or resource competition for resource uh mm, i think both because <clears throat> Uh, most of this movement uh, take indigeneity discourse, indigeneity concept, as uh, what we may call as the foundational or epistemological basis of the movement uh, since about 1990s, and particularly after um, UN RDP 2007 came up, uh, all this uh, community uh, who uh, uh, who took up the movement based their movement from this point of view. Although, as we said, the government of India have not yet uh, adopted this. Uh, resource uh, is uh, at the core of this movement, in, in uh, all this movement. And naturally, they claim for territory, which means uh, territory, land, land is a resource. And every movement we talk about land as an identity, uh, they will always say that we cannot live without land. Land is our identity. And naturally, resource is at the core of that. And the moment you lose your territory, the moment you uh, give up your territory as if you are losing your own identity. So this ideological uh, uh, base, based on resource, a very deep connection with resource, is a part and parcel of all this movement. We have one minute left, and we can take one last question. Okay, two last questions. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Kalol Kashyap, a uh, master's student at Ambedkar University. So I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is directed to uh, Dr. Billy. So you talk about uh, literary productions and imaginations in Manipur. So my question is that, is that paving the way for re-theorizing resistance? Like, can we move beyond the street and the battlefield to centering the cultural in the realm of resistance, like having cultural forms of resistance as the primary mode of looking at things? And my second question is to Dr. Uh, uh In terms of understanding, having a comparative reading of conflict in Northeast, like can we reconcile that with not using the violent language of the state? Like, can we reconcile both things with having a comparative reading and not using the state's violent language. So with that, is it possible to imagine a unique dictionary of politics for the state? So those are my two questions. A little radical theoretical maybe, but yeah, that's my question. Uh, the first question is directed to Doc. Uh, I have a very brief question. Uh, since you talked about the changing nature of conflicts and tribal identity after the 90s, so my question is, what is the correlation between these changing nature of conflicts and identity, tribal identities, and the rise of the neoliberal world order since the 90s? Um, I would say that I'm a little confused with your question because cultural resistance actually in Manipur at least preceded what is happening on the streets. Panela's um, play, Pebet, um, was performed in 1975. Um, Pebet, probably people will know more about it. A, a, a folk tale that was adapted into a play, which kind of like um, plays on the colonization of Manipur, the cultural colonization that, that took place in the 17th century with Sanjidas Gosai coming in. So you have like a cat monk coming in, trying to entice a family of young birds with a mother, uh, uh, young birds with and a mother into the um, the Hindu or whatever Sanskritized uh, way of life. And also, for example, um, when I talk about Draupadi, the, the first performance of Draupadi was in the year 2000. But it was later in 2004, um, after Manorama was gang raped and, um, and murdered in extrajudicial custody, that um, the protest took place. So when the first play was first performed, it was banned in Manipur. And people talked uh, uh Kanhela and Sabitri, you know, um, dragged into the streets for not, I mean, literally not. Um, um, for this role being on stage, but when it happened in reality in 2004, um, the play suddenly became very, very popular, and you would find it has been performed like endless times thereafter. So, yeah. All right. Uh, 
uh, time is running out. Um, I I agree that we should uh, avoid uh, using the violent language of state. Uh, but then sometimes when it uh, comes to uh, asserting an idea, we invariably fall into that trap uh, unless we are able to um, make a new invention, a new, a new, a new um, proposition against that. Say the term like uh, tribe, indigenity, indigenous people. Uh, I agree, this is this is a term we cannot. Uh, although we don't like, we cannot do without it. Um, when when we express ideas, because the idea itself is within that um, um, that order uh, of state. So uh, we need to do. We need to. Um, overcome this by by way of uh, inventing our own terms. Uh, connection, uh, as I already said, um, we we come up with the new term, a new concept, a modern concept of indigenity, um, where uh, Professor Carlson is a part of it when all these debates and uh, discussions were held in the United Nations and in different international fora. Uh, the issue has been uh, uh, discussed and debated, and eventually in 2007, uh, this become as one of an international instrument, legal instrument. Uh, I'm trying to understand how this idea in the discussion, in the debate, we see that many of, many, many, many representative representations from Northeast and from India, from tribal communities, they were also part of this debate and discussion. And the idea has been already well aware of in the debate, in the public debate and in the academic discussion across Northeast. So much so that all these movements uh, either you talk about Naga movement or Mizo movement or, or all these movement across the region. We're much, much aware of this. That, and they're very conscious about that. Uh, and um, even, even before um, it become uh, a, a truly international legal instrument, the idea has been already adopted by many of these movements. You talk about Naga movement or uh, we have been Kalbiang Long, we have been um, um, North Kachar Hill, Mizoram, Manipur. This idea has been already well entrenched uh, within that movement. And it resulted into, my argument is that this resulted into a new level of debate and, and, and a new forms of, of violent conflict. Uh, which uh, we can see if the history, if you read the history of uh, violence in the region, which consists of, as I said, um, ethnic cleansing movement. And that is how I make this connection of what you may call as neoliberal order vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, local conflict. Uh, in fact, uh, when this debate was um, uh, taking place, in international forum. Many, many anthropologists have warned that um, this is going to bring uh, some kind of uh, local tensions. It is going to bring uh, confusions. It is going to bring conflict. And many, many scholars have opposed the very concept of indigenity itself. And it happens in the Northeast. Thank you. Uh, it was a very fruitful discussion, enlightening, and I definitely enjoyed it. I'm sure all of you enjoyed it. Uh, let us conclude the panel, and I'm sure the organizers have some announcement to be made. Uh, thank you, my panel. Thank you. We can now all move to lunch, just lunch outside, and hopefully, um, We'll be, yeah, we'll be starting dot at two o'clock. Thank you so much, Professor Carlson, for joining us very early in the morning. <laughs>
we'll be concluding this session and starting the next session at two o'clock. Thank you.
And can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. All right, so I mean, should I put my camera off and and yes, unmute yes. myself for now? Yes, yes, it's working fine. Thank you so much for joining me. No problem. See you soon. Bye. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome everyone to the second and final panel of the day, uh, following an excellent uh, keynote by Aurup Jyoti Saikia and uh, a very good discussion uh, uh, on the first uh, panel. We now uh, turn to the performative uh, aspects of indigeneity. Uh, even though I think uh, uh, some aspects of it uh, were anticipated in the uh, previous panel, we uh, heard quite a bit about uh, uh, the performance of indigeneity in uh, literature and theatre on the first panel. But now uh, we will be looking at how uh, indigeneity has been performed through political movements uh, in historical trajectories and also ecological imaginations. We will make a slight change to the uh, order of presentations uh, so that uh, we can have uh, Arkotong Longkumar, who is joining us uh, online, um, speak first. And then we'll turn to Joy L.K. Patua. <coughs> and finally, the organizer of this uh, conference, uh, the Mithal Institute's fellow, Okur uh, Tamuli uh, Phukan. Uh, Arkhaton Longkumar is uh, a senior lecturer in modern Asia at the University of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, Joy, sitting next to me, is associate professor at the Center for Historical Studies at JNU. And Donkur, as I've already mentioned, is uh, currently a fellow mm. of the Mithal South Asia Institute. So uh, may I 
uh, ask uh, Arkotong uh, Longkuma uh, to give his presentation. I have asked everyone to limit themselves to 15 minutes so that we have uh, enough time for questions and discussion. So, Professor Longkuma. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and um, good afternoon to you. It's a cold Edinburgh like morning here, uh, like we have had snow last night. So um, it's a, a very different environment, I'm sure. Um, so I have prepared my talk primarily for around 12 minutes. I think that was the brief that I was given in my email. So I'll try and stick with that yes, even a lot of time. And if I yeah, but um, the uh, like 15 minutes, I mean, hopefully I should be able to accomplish my talk within that. So I want to, um, can you hear me okay? Is everything all right? Yes, everything's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wonderful, because I'm just hearing, uh, like hearing a little bit of feedback. So I just wondered. So the talk is, um, it's called three or four ways of thinking about indigeneity and i want to reflect a bit more on different ways in which we think about indigeneity in the like region over the years of my research so indigeneity or issues around indigenous peoples have increasingly become challenging in contemporary india nowhere is this truer than in the northeast with its different ethnicities religious affiliations and political belongings Below, I offer briefly three or four ways of thinking about indigeneity with an understanding that there is, all, uh, like there is often an overlap between them. It nevertheless helps us think more clearly about the terrain and understand some of the complexities. First, I want to look at the way in which indigeneity is used in a descriptive sense. Many people and communities are now choosing to replace tribe with indigenous. Tribe, as many know, is constitutionally enshrined and refers to certain strategies to improve the situation of the scheduled tribes related to development, affirmative action and protective arrangements. The synonym between tribe and indigenous is not always equivalent, but the corresponding indigenous tribes is now used as a way of covering all bases. Do these linguistic shifts mean much? or is it primarily a way of demonstrating strategic usage between how one positions oneself and who one addresses? I suggest that the global circulation of these descriptive terms have an impact on how people use them, but also how they describe themselves. The second way we can think about indigeneity is through the idea of performative capital. The term indigenous has taken on a transnational resonance that relates it with issues around rights, particularly UN rights related to the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People or like UN DRIP. For example, some have argued that the Hornbill Festival in like Nagaland celebrated annually represents this global reach through the celebration of culture. One version of the Hornbill Festival is that it is associated with the United Nations celebration of the first international decade of the world's indigenous peoples between 1995 and 2004. According to a prominent Naga human rights activist, Nyunglo Krome, they organize an event called Naga Week, where amidst the most difficult period in like Nagaland, when there were clashes amongst the different Naga nationalists and between the Indian security forces, like Nagaland People's Movement for Human Rights and the Naga Students Federation called for a lull in violence. The event was celebratory and emotional, but also a show of solidarity amongst the different Naga peoples from all over Northeast India and Western Burma that visualized through the performity of culture, the sovereignty of the Naga people. For Krome, the festival, at least in its first form, was firmly associated with the indigenous people's movement and what it means to be indigenous. In the Naga case, indigeneity is often associated with ties to land, tradition and custom 
and importantly with sovereignty and national self-determination. So in a way, the Naga Week celebration consolidated these abiding concerns into a larger Naga festival that married the best of all worlds, at least according to the UN standard of celebrating indigenous life in all its richness, cultural, political, and social. This connects to my third point about global, ind global indigeneity and nationalism. <clears throat> What began as an exercise to celebrate Naga indigeneity and to bring together the different Naga tribes from all over like Nagaland has brought about global connections. For example, during the Edinburgh military tattoo in the summer of 2014, Naga traditional performers were invited for the month long celebration by the producer Brigadier Alfrey. Unlike the usual military focus, the Lagnaga group's emphasis was on cultural performance. The Edinburgh tattoo became a reality for the Nagas because Brigadier Alfrey was invited to the Hornbill Festival in 2013. During this time, it was suggested to Alfrey by the Chief Minister of Nagaland that giving a platform to the Nagas would popularize the Hornbill Festival further and also provide an opportunity to the Nagas traveling to Edinburgh to have a, and I quote, a dynamic impact on Naga society, end quote, upon their return. According to Gugs Chishi, the leader of the Naga contingent to, to Edinburgh, it was not simply about being good ambassadors and encouraging tourists to come to the Hornbill Festival. Gugs noticed that his performers mindset had changed since the day they arrived. They began to adopt the concept of thinking like Nagas first before one's own tribal identity. This kind of national identity was affirmed during their Scottish visit, not only at the personal level, but also as one nation to another. Their visit came at a time when Scotland was considering its own national identity in the build-up to the referendum in, separate, in September 2014. Indeed, one of the tattoo organisers even highlighted the common ground for Scottish and Naga national movements. Could it be that the performance of culture present in the Hornbill Festival and tattoo relates closely to the transnational exchange of ideas and encounters, and whereby indigeneity as a global aesthetic brands its kind of in, as a global aesthetic brand enables a translation that ends up shaping the indigenous experience at home. This example is about the portrayal of a Naga a nation and being seen to be treated as a nation. My fourth and final point relate to issues around indigeneity and citizenship. With the growing influence of different political movements in the northeast of India, particularly represented by the Sangh Parivar, notions of indigeneity and citizenship are shifting. Uh, Hindutva actors are keen to present their political movement as a civilizational one that pegs indigeneity with off the soil against foreign influence. Religion here comes to the fore primarily because of the dominance of Christianity amongst the different hill tribes, but also because of the different ways in which the, the Muslim presence in the region has ignited debates primarily around the Citizenship Amendment Act or the CAA. Christianity is criticized as foreign and Sangh activists' conception of the indigenous do not accommodate the ways in which Christianity and nationalism converge. Eschew all forms of secessionism, Sangh activists will say, for that is a foreign idea introduced by colonial powers to cause the disintegration of the country. Instead, one can be a patriotic Christian develop a ways of returning to a more benevolent form of Christianity that aligns with the principles of the Indian nation. 
In fact, there is an understanding amongst various non-Christian indigenous movements in the region that explicitly argue for the UN principle of the preservation of indigenous traditions and argue for the rights to be protected from pressures imposed by dominant groups, i.e. Christianity. Such global networks associated with organizations like Rewatch or the Research Institute of World's Ancient Traditions, Cultures and Heritage allow indigenous traditions to interact with counterparts from native traditions worldwide, such as the Native Americans, pagan groups and so on. The CAA's emphasis on religion and promise to include Hindus and other minorities undermines the intent of the NRC and the Assam Accord and demonstrates the Hindu rights larger territorial vision of Akhand Bharat or undivided India that stretches all the way from Afghanistan, Pakistan, present day India to Bangladesh, Myanmar and parts of Southeast Asia, an idea that is encapsulated in their vision of Greater India. Such a, such a vision, however, comes with territorial uncertainty in the Northeast due to the large presence of indigenous peoples whose cultural identities are shaped very much across the trans, trans Himalaya and Southeast Asian regions rather than with those in the heartlands of India. Incorporating indigenous peoples of the region into the vision of Hindutva as an indigenous principle grounded in the soil not only has implications for the projects of envisioning a Hindu nation, but questions the very autonomy and sovereignty of their projects, or questions the very autonomy and sovereignty that many indigenous peoples have fought for. For this reason, there is a large opposition to the CAA in the Northeastern states, not solely because it is anti-Muslim, but also because it is anti-indigenous. Customary laws around land, agrarian practices of farming, hunting, and access to resources play a crucial role in how indigenous peoples frame their independence and sovereignty. Capitulating to the CAA with its desire to legitimize certain citizens over others and introducing variables such as population migration highlight the challenging ways in which land and belonging still pervade much of the emotionally charged discussions around livelihood and citizenship. The implementation of the CAA attempt to create a comradeship based on like religion, but crucially through a centripetal dissemination of ideas grounded in the idea of one nation, one language and one religion. This is a development that requires more thinking particularly in a region that historically celebrated its autonomy and sovereignty. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that presentation. Very insightful points uh, about uh, the performance of indigeneity and uh, also towards the end of your talk for raising some very serious contemporary concerns, uh, which we will address in discussion. Um, but I would want uh, the other presentations uh, uh, first, uh, before we uh, open up for discussion. And therefore, now let me uh, turn to Joy to uh, present her work. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to Professor Bose, and thank you to the Mitchell Foundation for having invited me to give this uh, talk. And um, um, I must admit that uh, as a historian, I've not really looked at the Northeast from the point of view of indigeneity. And so um, the, the, uh, the, the occasion this afternoon, this today has uh, sort of made me uh, kind of consider the category of indigeneity and see how it fits uh, with the Mizor case because I'm from the uh, I'm from Mizoram and uh, that's the area that I do my work on. So basically talk about how uh, the concept of indigeneity, if at all, is something that 
uh, that the people of uh, Mizoram, uh, whether they deal with it or not. Also want to thank uh, Arkutong for sort of laying out uh, the, the, the idea, the four concepts that he has spoken about. And I think they are very uh, important and they kind of speak to what I have to uh, say today as well. So um, what I want to present today is sort of um, an internal view of what indigeneity would mean for the people of Mizoram. And um, even as I look through uh, the history of, uh, the, of, of the Mizos, uh, uh, um, I think that um, you know, words like indigenous or words like tribe um, are often words that are uh, more um, uh, categories of, of discourse rather than ascriptive uh, or self-ascriptive categories. So if you uh, speak to a Mizo today, a Mizo uh, would not sort of, uh, the, uh, the idea of indigeneity would not po possibly resonate with the Mizos as much as perhaps the idea of indigeneity resonates with, say, the Adivasis of the mainland. Okay, so I think that is something that we need to uh, bear in mind uh, as well. So I find that when we think about the people of Mizoram, uh, indigeneity is not a category of, of ascription. It could be a category for some organizations now uh, to demand for certain kinds of recognition. I know, for instance, that there is a group that wants to go to the UN uh, and uh, to recognize the Mizos as an indigenous group. So that's a sort of a small minority, but in the larger sort of political discourse of Mizoram, this word does not uh, resonate very much. However, mm, uh, as has already been mentioned by others as well, there are different discourses that are quite similar to this idea of indigeneity. And for Mizoram, it is often uh, framed within these two words called Ram and Nam. Ram meaning land and Nam meaning, uh, I mean, it can, it basically could mean tribe or nation. Okay, so uh, it, it kind of uh, uh, sort of merges together. And so, so it can sometimes translated as tribe, sometimes translated as nation as well. And so uh, being a historian, I want to, trace um, uh, this kind of uh, trajectory of how this rum and this sum has been understood in the case of, uh, of the region that I'm talking about. We will, uh, uh, what I'm going to say, uh, you know, is that to talk about, it, uh, to show certain fluidity even within these categories of rum and sum, uh, I want to talk about the drivers of this uh, idea uh, of rum and sum and the context in which these ideas have developed. And of course, uh, I think uh, everyone would agree that colonial modernity has a role to play in the creation of this identity as a territorial identity. So uh, I want to take uh, sort of four moments in time. One is, of course, the pre-colonial and quickly go through those ideas, pre-colonial, the colonial, the post-colonial and the contemporary. And um, I forgot to mention this, but I want to, uh, you know, title my paper as Indigeneity and the Politics of Naming, okay, among the Mizo. So that's basically what I'm heading towards. So if you look at, um, you know, uh, yeah, and the other thing that I want to state at this moment is that, you know, uh, many, very often when I'm asked to give talks, people will always say that Mizoram, nobody knows about Mizoram, you know, and I don't know whether that is a feeling that you have in the uh, in the crowd today as well, but but uh, what I want to say is that despite the sort of silence in comparison to other states in the Northeast, there is a lot of uh, talk among the Mizos with regard to what this idea about Ram and Nam is, and we all know that um, you know it's, Mizo is a common language; it is a largely homogeneous state. And so there's a lot of literature that is coming out from the 1930s, 1920s, tens about who are we as a people. Okay, so the discourse on indigeneity often uh, boils down to this idea of who are we as a people. Um, 
I don't know whether I should, I don't, we don't have much time, so I don't want to talk too much about the pre-colonial people uh, period, but in the pre-colonial period, this idea of identity usually boiled down to being members of a chief village. Okay, so this is very different from a territorialized understanding of a people. So if people ask you who, who, I mean, where a person was from, it would suggest they would, they would, refer to themselves as people of a particular chief's village. So this is an identity that is in a sense moving, that it is an ident and also and it is an identity on the move because chiefs often move because of June cultivation, also because of attacks by other people and also because you know uh, a village had to be divided amongst various sons of the chief as well. So identity was always an identity that was on the move. It was not territorial. It was not fixed. So that's the first sort of in the in the discourse on on um, rum and num or land and people. We have to understand the fluidity of the nature of this identity. Of course, in the colonial period, we uh, we often uh, uh, it it the identity becomes uh, ter territorialized. And it's interesting that many chiefs recognize this territorialization of this identity as a larger uh, generic Mizo identity. So even though the region was known as Lushai Hills in the past, uh, the chiefs began to understand uh, the creation of this uh, sort of larger generic Mizo identity. So a chief uh, writing in a, a journal called Mizo Le Evai, would say that in the beginning we belong to many villages, but now we are part of this one uh, um, community. Okay, we are part of. We fought against each other, but we are part of this one, one, one community. So, um, uh, so uh, we also recognize that uh, there is a slow. I mean, unlike the Naga Hills, for instance, uh, uh, Mizo villages were always multi-ethnic, you know? They were always multi-ethnic and it did not belong to one particular tribe. Although in the Mizo case, there was also um, a larger uh, chiefly clan. You may have heard of the name Silos. So this, all those Silos were not always the rulers as well. There was a larger chiefly clan. So from this kind of a political uh, sort of, um, uh, a political organization, you become organized into a, a district and a larger uh, uh, Mizo identity sort of uh, developed as a, as a result of that. So um, uh, in terms of uh, the writing about it, therefore, as Arup has mentioned in the morning as well, uh, there is a vernacular history writing that developed that also contributes to this identity. So from as early as 1920s, uh, uh, you have the development of vernacular histories that are talking about this idea of the Mizos as a nation. Where are they from? Uh, who constitutes the Mizos? What tribe constitutes the Mizos? All of that developed from the 1920s onwards. Uh, and uh, so the culmination of this uh, idea of a territorialized Mizo identity and all the groups within the Mizo identity uh, coming together uh, can be actually seen in uh, in in songs and poetry that that become very sort of uh, part of popular culture in the 1950s. So there is a song by a person uh, named uh, Rokunga, and he, he 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 he. It's called, the song is called Kanzo Klang Ram Nuam, which is our beauteous pleasant hills. So there is. Some kind of nostalgia being attributed uh, to the idea of the hills, and this kind of idea that the hills belong to the people of Mizoram, and what the hills uh, mean for the people is an idea that is actively being discussed and discoursed within uh, within uh, within the the, uh, the Lushai Hills, and then what becomes the Mizo Hills uh, district as well, and. Uh, uh, you know, there's a work by R. Van Loma, which came out in the 1960s, which talks about Karam Leke, which is my country and uh, and I. Okay, so uh, 
I just wanted to focus on this trajectory of this development wherein uh, people belong to a village and then there is a move towards, a there is a, a, a larger understanding of the development of a district uh, and the identity that draws from this territorialized understanding of who the Mizos are. So, um, and we must also realize that um, throughout the history of uh, of uh, of Mizoram, uh, uh, the Lushais are never, even though the district is named Lushai Hills District, the Lushais are not always the ones who are driving the discourse. It is people of other tribes, especially the Raltes, who are driving the discourse around the identity of, of the Mizos. Okay? So that's the second point. That is the second sort of uh, uh, post-colonial and uh, and uh, and uh, colonial and post-colonial mo moments that we see. And of course, uh, if you if you are aware of the uh, the political development, Mizoram becomes a union territory, and then goes on to the, uh, develop a, become a state in the 70s and the and the 80s. So in a way, uh, the discourse on uh, Ram and Nam. Uh, get, is sort of gets crystallized and sort of see, sees its culmination in the uh, in the development of Mizoram as a as a state in the in the 1980s. Now I want to uh, 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 look at how this has impacted uh, the Mizo understanding of who they are as um, as uh, as a people. And one of the things that this territorialization and um, uh, of identity, and it's something that I have mentioned in my book, Being Mizo, which talks about a, a, you know burial in a in a locality, you know, and how this identity of how this idea of territorial territoriality sort of uh, gets a resonance in the people is that the idea that you have to be buried in your local cemetery or your local graveyard uh, is I think in a way uh, the uh, the the um, the apex of this idea of the development of um, of uh, of um, of uh, of territoriality and your identity okay so I won't get into that but the last point that I want to talk about is uh, this idea even though this uh, idea of uh, the boundary of Mizoram being a fixed idea has been very strong in recent times. Um, there has been a sort of new uh, wave that comes not from within Mizoram, but from outside Mizoram to give a larger uh, um, sort of generic um, uh, idea to the, to the name. So you may have heard of of Zo as a community. And so increasingly, uh, from outside the borders of Mizoram, there is increasingly uh, and uh, there is a, a movement to consider the Mizos as one of the many tribes of the Zo. So a larger Zo category is being formed from, uh, a, from uh, an earlier um, uh, from not from within the people of the state, but from outside the state, especially from Burma and from Manipur as well. So, um, if you think of it as a as a development of a particular trajectory, you realize that there is a move from a, a sort of a village identity to a larger complex that is that goes beyond international borders from uh, Myanmar as well as from Manipur and also. Uh, the half long area of Assam is still not included, but I'm sure that that is going to be part of the larger movement. And so there is this politics of uh, a broader political identity that is developing. Uh, and this is being uh, sort of uh, 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 pushed by uh, people uh, who are from, not so much from within the state, but from outside the state as well, because of the kind of uh, uh, conditions that exist in these other areas as well. So. Uh, if you talk about refugees that are from uh, coming in from Myanmar, it's uh, into Mizoram and especially from the Chin Hills, it's this larger sort of discourse that is developing about uh, uh, a broader uh, umbrella term 
for what the British once called as the Lushai Kuki Chin group. So this larger uh, identity of the Zhou identity is seen to be emerging, and that is the way in which uh, you know the indigeneity in a way plays out in in the state. So indigeneity, I think, in the case of the Mizos, uh, and uh, is this um, is this is a is a development of a of a of a of a broader sort of generic identity for terms for for, for a term that the British coined as Lushaitan uh, cookie. Okay, so my time is up, I believe. So <laughs> I think that's all I can say for now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pashwaru, uh, for uh, first of all uh, reminding us that. Uh, the term or concept uh, indigeneity may not have quite the same resonance uh, in uh, different parts of the Middle East. Uh, we have looked at Assam, uh, Manipur, uh, Nagaland in uh, earlier uh, uh, sessions, and uh, but going beyond uh, what you mentioned about you know, comparable terms and concepts being in circulation, but not quite indigeneity. As a historian, you've given us a, a very compelling trajectory of how, uh, you know, there are shifts in which markers of identity come to be emphasized, mm -hmm. you know, from a pre-colonial notion of just belonging to a chief's village to a much more territorialized conception in uh, colonial times, which possibly gets to be further strengthened uh, with the formation of the Union Territory and the state of Mizoram. But now there seems to be a new trend uh, where uh, there are certain extraterritorial definitions of the Mizo identity, which are also uh, coming into, uh, into play. Uh, we will return to some of these uh, uh, issues uh, in discussion, but let's have the uh, final presentation uh, of the day from uh, Ungkur Pukan. Thank you, uh, Professor Bose. Uh, I'll speak about uh, the power of spectacularity, Asa movement, uh, the politics of subjectivation and, uh, and the politics of partial objects. Uh, most of us probably uh, remember Assam movement for the brutal killing in Nelly, an area in central Assam on 18 February, 1983. More than 2000 individuals lost their lives on, the, on that fateful day. The victims were individuals of the East Bengal origin Muslim community of Assam. Official reports indicated that a large crowd of neighboring Tiwa community attacked these villages in, in the early hours and massacre continued until afternoon. Mutilated bodies of men, women, children, and children lying across the paddy fields in half, half burned houses and on the riverbanks were the most haunted images of the time. Even today, the threat of an impending identity clash has not died down. In a very complex and different way, in, in the contemporary Northeast India, a very rigid, simplistic, simplistic binary of indigenous, settler, insider, outsider, tribal, non-tribal has emerged as the fundamental identity marker in the political and social discourses. This phenomenon risks legitimizing a new pattern of exploitation, dispossession, subordination, and subcitizenship in the region. For some commentators, it is uh, the contingencies of colonial and post-colonial legislation of cultural differences by classification of cases and people into various slots, or their incongruities in the contemporary time. There, there's no denying of the role of British colonialism in creating the field of binary identity. But even then, I believe we need to trace the actual anatomy of the constitution of binary identities in the tactics of mobilization in politics of subjectivation. In next couple of minutes, I'll discuss Assam movement's uh, mobilization uh, strategies and its cru crucial reliance 
on spectacularity to show that even though the logic of violence might be traced in a longer historical trajectory, populist politics of Assam movement with strategies of subjectivation, performative idioms, and partial objects produced an overwhelmingly threatening, spatially separated, rigid Assamese nativist identity. The rioting crowd. Staging the crowd was an integral part of Assam movement's mobilization strategy. The overflowing mass meetings, the serpentine line of masses in professions, and the coming together of thousands of people on the streets to break the government imposed curfew remain some of the most arresting images of the Assam movement. The unprecedented numerousness of the protesting crowd was hardwired by a coordinated set of custodian social strategies ranging from social boycott and public humiliation to indoctrination campaigns and citizen curfew, citizens' curfew. In this mutually reinforcing play between spectacularity and disciplinarity, the Assamese nationalist politics of subjectivation underwent a critical transformation during this phase. The new nationalist subject of Assam movement had to both constitute and par perform the spectacle. The fusion of thousands of bodies within a single optic frame was not merely a propaganda technique. The emphasis on the performance also raised the function of the nationalist subject from being a faceless disease in the census rule <clears throat> to, to the embodied visibility of agitators and marchers. This transformation set in a spectrum of new political possibilities, which were not necessarily exhausted by the movement itself. Bihu, the National Festival of Assam, played a critical role in it. The Bihu stage was restructured as the corollary of the movement, its, achieve, its achievements and sacrifices, and most importantly, to articulate the cumulative might of Assamese nation in the face of state repression and violence. The contribution of Assam movement was that it streamlined a representative structure for the Assamese nation, fixed it within the Bihu stage, while placing the audience in a state of constant disease. The authority of the nation had been achieved through the strategy of social boycott, articulation of mob psyche, and through the threat of violence. It was not simply an, an, an immigrant, it was not simply an, an hesitation against an immigrant or so-called uh, outsider community, but the mobilized mob ran shaked the dissenters' houses and demanded immediate switch of loyalty as intimidating large crowds of furious men and women stationed themselves in their front yard. The, vigil Sorry. the vigilantism of the mob reached its height in the first half of 1983, when the movement's official stance of nonviolence was obscured by a strings of riots in different parts of Assam. The organizational leadership as a rule formally distanced itself from, the, uh, from such actions, actions, but unofficial, confidential communique circulating within the movement can provide illustration of the techniques adopted by the movement strategies to bring into popular outburst. Bihu was seen as a natural home of such, such national spectacle. The success of mobilizing an energized network mass depend, then, depended, dependent on collapsing the boundary between a participatory audience and a guardian of Bihu stage. If anything in the performance was perceived to be out of sync with the nationalist requir requirements, for instance, singing a Hindi song on the Bihu stage, the activists interrupted the provocative, emotional, and acerb acerbic com comments, and the possibility of disruption turning into riots could keep the Bihu stage in line. There was a growing conceptual similarity between audience of the Bihu stage and the rioting crowd in the distant villages. In encouraging, in encouraging populist vigilantism, loosely held together by a set of well-known but officially undeclared techniques, the movement could make Bihu a literal theater of performing allegiance. However, although effective and successful in many ways, the strategy was also punctuated by local material and effective conditions. Individual dissolves into, into the masses or masses into an individual. The looming threat from the outsiders, from the immigrant, now could only be resisted, not just in a large event like riots and violence,
But this mutually complementing category of individual and masses, the constituent spectacle would resist the so-called aggression of the outsiders or the immigrants in a day-to-day -day level. The riot and rioter were universalized. The abstract figure roam around everywhere in the markets and the bazaars where the non-locals, the so-called outsiders, settlers would actually operate. If or, if or needed, it simply transformed into its actual figuration. figuration. The threat of violence became the operative agenda of the movement. This mutual, mutually complementing category of individual and masses after the movement reinvented itself as a revol revolutionary individual of United Liberation Front of Assam, the ALPA. Initially, through bank robbery, then massive, uh, then the sudden, sudden killings of Marwari, or a Bihari or a Bengali businessman, the rank members of the so-called Indian imperialist communities, by riding on a, on a two-wheeler, the structure of riot continued. The Assamist nationalist politics of subjectivation had shifted to a different line in 1990. The partial objects. If Assamist subjects place themselves as a universal rioter, then the Assamist national symbols like Dholpepa, Gamusa, Bihunamo, too, underwent a critical transformation. They were creatively deplo deployed in rallies, particularly in cultural processions during Bihu, and Assamese commentators would emphasize how the performance of Dhulpepa, Bihu Nam, and Borgit, uh, uh, Borgit symbolized the rich cultural heritage of Assamese, and how growing influx of immigrants was, threaten was, uh, was threatening this unique heritage. But what is interesting here is the unmistakable correspondence between the spectacle of cultural profession and the structure of riot. The musical instruments like dhol, daba were extensively used in different riots as a cue for violent collective actions, mass gatherings, the dissemination of information, etc. When the movement, sorry, I have to. When the movement officially asked its volunteers to sabotage the election campaign of 1983, a secret communique was circulated which categorically traced, traced the use of toll for making public announcements. It reads, in the village areas, the publicity should be abrupt and should be done with the rhythms of toll. In case any emergency, the announcement should be made even entering, entering in the cinema hall. After the, after the beating of toll, announcement should be made, it reads. By 1983, with the growing violence, riots, and subsequent police atrocities, the writer poet Nirmala Prabha Bordoloi emphasized, we'll, and I quote, we'll have to regroup ourselves to the rhythms of that whole. The musical instruments of Bihu performance doubled as weapons of the masculine might of, of the Assamese nation. Such investment, investment were simply not Metaphorical, metaphorically existing. I, li I would like to give you give two contemporary examples which, which distinctly help us understand the critical significance of their mediation. A 2015 reporter emphasized the disconnection between Assam movement's deliberation of violence and the rhythm of Doba, the reverent Vaishnavite musical instrument. I quote, the rhythm of Doba was, was the cue for Assamese to come out with spears and arrows in hand. That cue was the sig signal to get organized for rioting. The day was 18th February, 1983. The attack was launched in eight villages of neighboring Gueshra town. Remembering the fateful day, Pankos Biswas said, the rhythm of Doba of the Namgars in the evening still shivered down his spine as on that particular day, the attackers gathered and marched to the rhythm of the Doba. The construction of Dhol, or for that matter, Doba or Nagera, as the masculine insignia of the Assamese nation was not, not a simple unilateral process. It was shaped by the simultaneous and contradictory pools of violence and vivacity, date, and life. The rhythm of Dhol frightened the, frightened the enemy but they were also widely perceived as, as a life-giving force, as a call to sol sociality that could pull a damaged individual from dreadful depression and reunite with the world. 
Mohgwal or Bihu, a 2011 novel, takes pain to make this point. The protagonist of the novel, a water buffalo herder, had decided to commit suicide after a, after a broken love affair. In the wee hours of the night, slipping away quietly from his concerned colleagues, he made for a nearby water body to plant himself to death. But on his way, he heard the playing of the dhol in the distance. And then the novel reads, the rhythms of the dhol cast a spell over him. He forgot that he was to jump into the deepest depth of that lake. But the captivating rhythm of the dhol made him forget, uh, forgot everything. He suddenly decided he would become a dhulia, unquote. L look at the different mediative abilities of these objects. For one, the rhythm of Doba was a metaphor of dot, death. For another, it was simply life affirming. So, okay. The effective investment in Bihu symbols like Dhol, Bester, are the repertoire of death, life, and memory in a complex and uneven manner. This was why, within the narrative framework of, of the Samupen, the grimmest stories of xenophobia, intimidation, and targeted violence could be overwritten with romantic, tragic, heroic, and sentimental tales. Dole's biography did not die down here, or probably never will. In the 1990s, the difference of dole making techniques was invoked as a discourse against outsiders, particularly against the Bengali musical instrument, instrument maker. One of the major criticisms the practitioner was, con uh, was concerned was the specific difference between the knot of the dole and, uh, and a dhulki or a tabela. Allegedly, the non, non assamese craftsmen had adopted a dhulki or tabla method of knotting since they were unfamiliar with traditional methods of making an assamese dhul. It had, it, had, it had changed the sound of dhul uh, and uh, make it similar to dhulki and tabla. In the last decade or so, owing to an increased demand and heightened sensitivity around the issue, the production of dhul is reported to be growing and the local craftsmen have gained prominence. However, interestingly, the increase free of production, the local craftsmen too adopted the modified techniques of the outsiders as a way to meet the growing demand. That means, rather than the specific technologies, technologies of the making, the abstracted body of, a, of the local maker seems to authenticate the quality of the making. I think this mediation between the commodity, commodity and abstracted indigenous body is the new structure of politics that, that reproduces the script of simplistic binary in contemporary Northeast India, particularly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Omkur, for extending the discussion of the performative aspects of indigeneity from literature and theater uh, to a major cultural festival and music as well, including a musical instrument, the dhol. Uh, now, uh, before I bring the audience into the discussion, uh, let me just uh, highlight uh, some of the key points that have been made, not all. Uh, I think both uh, Arkotong Lunkamar and Joy Pachuau uh, have uh, told us uh, that naming matters. Uh, naming matters in different ways. Uh, uh, Dr. Longkumar has uh, uh, shown us uh, how uh, indigeneity can be thought about in three or four different ways, uh, how um, there is a slippage uh, between the uh, terms tribe and indigenous, and how that is sought to be overcome by putting them together in the form of uh, indigenous tribes. Uh, he has also uh, looked at the connection between you know, global discourses on indigeneity and how they relate in complex ways to nationalism. And this he did remarkably well by drawing the connection between Nagaland and Scotland. Uh, 
uh, but perhaps uh, some of the mo most urgent issues that he raised uh, have to do with uh, the relationship between indigeneity and citizenship and the way uh, the whole question of indigenous identity is being not just recast but attempted to be appropriated by the Sangh Parivar, the forces of Hindutva. Uh, given, of course, the strong Christian presence in the hills of the Northeast, and also the Muslim presence uh, in the countryside of uh, many parts of, uh, of Assam. And I thought it was uh, very interesting to hear from him <clears throat> that the CAA is being contested not just on the ground of principle that it is anti-Muslim or anti-religious minority, but it is being seen to be anti-indigenous in the sense that the indigenous is sort of understood in the Northeast, even though there are attempts to appropriate the whole notion of indigeneity by the forces of Hindutva. Just to digress a little, I almost missed my lunch because I was being bombarded by media inquiries during our lunch break uh, about uh, an appropriation of a different sort uh, that is being uh, attempted in India today. And apparently the governor of Bengal said something yesterday uh, about uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, which has agitated uh, many people in uh, Bengal, not least the the Bengali media. And since uh, I was uh, attending a conference on the Northeast, what came to my mind straight away uh, was to simply point out uh, who the key personnel of the Azad Hind Forge had been in the Northeast in that crucial uh, period of the Second World War. Uh, now, uh, the commander of the first division uh, of the, the Indian National Army, which fought in Imphal, uh, was Muhammad Zaman Kiani. The man who led the Gandhi Brigade of the four brigades or regiments that made up the first division of the INA was a man named Enayat Kiani. Um, one of the key commanders who took charge once things started going wrong in Imphal during that four month long siege was somebody who was uh, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose's only companion on his submarine voyage in 1943 from Europe to Asia, Abid Hassan, who way back in 1970 gave a magnificent Netaji oration titled The Men from Imphal. I was in uh, Imphal and Moirang uh, just before the pandemic, and I was taken uh, by uh, uh, a, sco a scholar and uh, uh, who uh, was supposed to come to this conference but could not in the end <clears throat> to Moirang to the to the INA museum, and shown the place where the Indian tricolor was hoisted in April of 1944. And it so happens that the man who hoisted the Indian flag of freedom was named Shokat Malik. Uh, and if you look at um, the uh, look at uh, the Naga areas, the battle around Kohima, there the Shubhash Brigade was being led by Shahnawaz Khan, and he was joined soon after, uh, you know, uh, by Mehboob Ahmed. These were the key figures who were fighting the war of liberation uh, in uh, what is today Manipur and Nagaland. And just reciting these names really puts the lie, uh, you know, uh, to the claims that are being made to try and appropriate what Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose stood for. Uh, by the by by the the current regime. Now, this is not to say that the people in Monipur and Nagaland were not 
actively involved, they were. And if you uh, think about what happened, there were the Manipuris who joined the Azad Hind Forge, including figures who became prominent in post-independence India, Koireng Singh, who became chief minister for a while, or Nilmoni Singh, they actually retreated with the INA once you know, uh, the siege of Imphal was broken uh, back to Burma, as did Fizo, who joined the Azad Hind uh, 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 movement and retreated uh, back into, uh, into Burma. Uh, so, you know, I, I raise this question as something of a digression because it's not wholly unrelated that how do we contest appropriations uh, of uh, what is meant to be indigenous identity or, or tribal identity and I mean, the question that I have for Arkotong uh, Longkumar is that to the extent that there is a realization that the CAA in some ways contradicts the NRC in the Northeastern sort of context, you know, how effective, you know, can be the resistance to the various forms of appropriation that are being attempted by a regime that seems to be very well entrenched at the apex of the Indian uh, state structure. Um, I think, uh, Joy, you have act, you know, given us a lot in the short span of 15 minutes. But I wondered when you were talking about what you described as the post-colonial sort of period, the post-independence decades, uh, there was, of course, um, uh, the uh, redrawing of state boundaries, uh, new states coming into existence. You mentioned Mizoram first as a union territory, then as a state. But when you trace the theme of territorialization of identity, can you really talk about specific periods without figuring out what, what was being done by the Indian state and what was being done by the Mizos themselves and in this context, I would be interesting to, um, uh, to uh, have your take on what was Laldenga thinking before he signed the accord, while he was leading the insurgency. Did his discourse on identity change or shift during the phase of insurgency uh, or from the period of the phase of insurgency to the period that he became the chief minister of the state of Mizoram? Uh, so uh, uh, that, that's a question that, uh, you know, uh, came to mind. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Onkur, of course, has talked about uh, spectacle um, and how cultural objects are deployed in some ways uh, to... Uh, find resonance among a large people of a sense of a somewhat aggressive nationalism or, or sense of, of nationhood. I mean, throughout the day today, I think we've struck a good balance between what I might call materiality and culture. There were various questions raised from the audience as well. Is it sort of... Uh, material factors or perhaps the cu cultural expression that mattered more in definitions of indigeneity and identity. And just to be a bit provocative, uh, I was just wondering whether or not uh, you are succumbing to a form of culturalism and not quite giving sufficient attention to the you know, to, to the underlying material factors which uh, contributed to the fractures, which were then, of course, you know, exploited in many sort of different ways. Uh, and I, I go back to, to my uh, old incarnation as a more materialist historian of agrarian change and, uh, and, uh, and suggest that, you know, um, uh, of course, it's very hard to depict the Bengali Muslims who uh, uh, migrated 
uh, from densely populated East Bengal districts as you know, outsiders in the sense that many of them came in the first three decades of the 20th century to open up new jute lands for cultivation and, and so forth. And uh, those kinds of groups uh, played a, quite a major role in what Aurip Jyoti Saikya was describing as the early agrarian movements of the immediate post-1947 era. You know, after all, that was a an area where Maulana Bhashani was uh, active and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so just a little bit of a provocation that where does your, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis of the cultural expression of a new kind of Assamese nationalism, particularly around 1983, connect to, you know, underlying sort of material forces, uh, forces at work. Uh, I have I've actually spoken for longer than I had wanted to, but I will give each speaker a brief response. You don't have to respond to everything that I've said uh, and then bring in the audience uh, to ask questions and make comments. So, Arkotong, would you like to start? Yes, um, thank you for the observations and um, for your generous comments. I think the... Um, the question of appropriation, I think that that is an interesting question because it seems to me that um, there is a lot of, um, well, I mean, of, of course, appropriation of history and so on. But I think what I am seeing is a kind of inclusion. I think this this idea of um, kind of encompassment that, you know, a kind of indigeneity is not really a problematic term um, for people like the Sang Parivar. They are actually quite happy to like use that and to also kind of like use that not only in, say, say like political slogans and so on, but also in terms of a discourse. So, I mean, I attended a seminar um, which was organized by um, kind of this intellectual um, group associated with the Sangh Parivar in, in Shillong. And the thing that really struck me was how they were emphasizing this idea of decolonizing uh, kind of Indian history, decolonizing, say, like Northeastern like history, but also really pushing for a kind of indigenous methodology. And so I was sitting there thinking, I mean, well, this could be a kind of seminar that I would, well, I mean, give, <laughs> well, in my kind of university. And this idea of how indigeneity plays out for them was quite, uh, quite interesting and quite kind of illuminating, I think. Um, because these kind of discourses are actually not limited to certain fields but are now spreading so when they were talking about traditional indigenous knowledge and how do we kind of organize conferences around this idea of uh kind of like knowledge indigenous knowledge so i think this this kind of appropriation i think is something that uh maybe has to be more kind of like nuanced in terms of how they are kind of able to encompass in all of these ideas. And, and um, so I, I find that quite interesting, especially in the ways in which they are kind of able to kind of operate. I think we should kind of like move away from this this kind of monolithic idea of the Sang Parivar as existing only in certain institutions, but also how um, their ideas and their activities have also kind of disseminated. So I think more in terms of encompassment is what I would think of. Um, the, the well, a really interesting thing that you talked about, uh, like Professor Bose, about the INA and of course like FISO's involvement, um the thing about F F about Fizo is that you know he's not seen as a kind of national like figure at all you know by the well, Hindu right and so on I mean he is in fact uh kind of marginalized in the kind of rhetoric so again that's probably an interesting interpretation of of history to suit certain um 
political kind of landscapes. So I'll just end it there. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, sorry, I can't really hear. I, I can't hear what you're saying. Um, right. I, I hope that our technical people can uh, uh, help sort this out. I will. Yeah, okay. I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so, uh, no, I was just saying uh, briefly that this is a very tricky terrain to navigate because so many of us have been calling for the decolonization of the writing of Indian and South Asian history uh, uh, for, for some time now, but not quite the way that uh, the forces of Hindutva would like that to, uh, to, to happen. And, uh, and, and so I think uh, uh, there needs to be a, a, a nuanced and yet powerful response. Uh, to some of the ways in which, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, to my mind, the travesty is being made of this whole process of decolonizing South Asian history. But uh, but I'll uh, leave that for a for a later discussion and turn to uh, uh, Joy and Onkur and then open up to other questions. Right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bose, for those uh, uh, kind comments on, on, on the paper. And uh, I, I did miss out the whole bit of, of the Mizo National Front and the movement and, and things like that. And, and definitely the MNF, uh, 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 you know, um, proposed the idea of a greater Mizoram that would, in, and even till date, we can maps that they have created, which includes large portions of Manipur and Myanmar, uh, the, especially the Chin Hills area, and also parts of uh, uh, Tripura and, and Bangladesh as well. So uh, so uh, the MNF definitely had this idea of a greater uh, Mizoram. But of course, uh, uh, at the time of the accord, uh, that could not be uh, concretized. And uh, since the MNF movement had a lot of people from Manipur joining it as well, uh, many uh, uh, people from that region have felt betrayed by the MNF as well. So, uh, so, but however, I think, uh, as far as I can see, this idea of a greater Mizoram seems to have sort of been in the background. So groups like the People's Conference, the Brigadier T. Silos uh, Party and others have had that as part of their agenda. But in the larger imagination, the idea of this greater Mizoram from within the people of Mizoram, from within Mizoram has sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, declined over the years since the signing of the accord. But of late, as I was saying, this idea is gaining resurgence again, but it is being essentially propelled not from within Mizoram, but from um, from outside the state with a, a newer generic name. I mean, the name itself is not very new, but it has different kinds of political implications as well. So I think, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Uh, thank you, Professor Booth, for uh, this is a serious methodological question, actually. Uh, I've been trying to grapple with it and it's I don't know how uh, I'll. I hope in 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 coming days I'll have something that uh, I can you know make a conversation between political economy and 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 cultural uh, sort of theory. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, uh, may I now uh, open the floor for questions? Crispin's hand went up uh, very promptly, so we'll start with you. And then take the others. There are many on the in the row behind. Yeah. So I just wanted to um, comment that um, obviously there's been resistance uh, uh, against outsiders within the northeast for a very very long time. But the um, the two made the made a lot of the, the legacy the problems that the northeast faces today are significantly legacies of colonialism. Um, and the, the, the first major legacy of colonialism, is, of course, is the introduction of the concept of private property and of occupancy rights, 
which is fundamental to uh, claims to indigenous to being the original inhabitants. And I think it's no coincidence that we see these kind of indigenous uh, rights movements, particularly strongly in countries that were part of the old British Empire, um, because the law enshrined rights to the original occupants of any territory. So it's a contestable, legally contestable claim. But the other major legacy is the is the, the fundamental failure and indeed betrayal of British attempts at um, democratization in the 1930s, in that the large swathes of the Northeast were denied political representation altogether. And other areas were, were allowed representation, but only using the first past the post system, which gave power to the majority and denied completely political representation to minorities. So I'm just wondering um, whether uh, a very dear friend of mine who passed away recently is M.C. Raj, who was a Dalit activist. And he said that you know, ultimately the solution to um, the problems of minorities in India uh, lies uh, not in continual claims to separate nationhood, but, but actually in electoral reform, uh, the introduction of proportional representation in municipal, state, and uh, federal elections, so that every minority will find, above a certain level, will, will, will be able to achieve some sort of political representation at all levels of government. I mean, nationhood, the claim to nationhood the inf is, can become an infinite process of nations, sub-nations, and sub-sub-nations, is ultimately all about attempting to achieve political power and political authority. Um, and uh, the concept of proportional representation is now widely adopted in Europe, Australia, uh, even parts of the United Kingdom, but still being stuck with the old Westminster first past the post system sort of uh, entrenches majority rule in a way that's going to make it in the rights of minorities impossible ever to achieve. And I'm wondering whether the issue of uh, electoral reform rather than nationhood or, or secession uh, is, an issue, is, is an agenda that perhaps might in future come more to the fore in the politics of the Northeast as a possible peaceful solution. Does anyone want to have a quick stab at that question or shall we, in the interest of time, collect about three at a time and then get you to respond? Yeah. Uh, there are so many young uh, members of the audience. Yeah, let's go to the back. Uh, oh, okay. Hi, I'm Aswar. You have to move in. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm from I'm from Delhi University. My name is Aswash. So I have two questions primarily. One question pertaining to sir, so what you said to uh, Ankur sir, basically about the political economy of the idea of indigeneity itself. So uh, do you think at some point there's the there's relative deprivation that comes into play when you talk about you know uh, the conflicts that take place and uh, especially how resource extraction in the Northeast is a huge problem, especially given how Arunachal Pradesh at this point, there are multiple dam projects going on and there's huge conflicts going on. So do you see indigeneity in terms, in the realms of political economy, do you see this as a huge uh, precursor to the idea, the conflicts of uh, indigeneity? And second, uh, to, to what uh, Longkumar sir said about the, I believe that there is a certain appropriation of history taking place, a rewriting of history, as we talk about, as we notice what's been happening since 2014, as Sir mentioned. So uh, if we look at what is happening some days before we had something called a Lassit Dibok, which was basically um, a celebration of 400 years of Lassit, Lassit Borfukon. So uh, it was a huge fanfare celebratory event. So do we at some point see there's a huge hijacking of these indigenous ideas or people's ideas of the Northeast? And do you see in the future this might be a threat to the idea of indigeneity itself? Um, 
Very good afternoon to all of you. My name is John Tangwasangwiti. I am a researcher with the Jawaharlal Nehru University, and I am a senior resettlement assistant with the UNHCR India. So my question is particularly to uh, Professor Joy Patel. Uh, Professor, uh, I mean, it was an enlightening and insightful talk that you just gave. So uh, related to the territoriality that you just mentioned about, the Zo community is common to Manipur and Mizoram. And among the Zo Kukichin I, uh, nomenclature that you have, Mizoram is the most popular, I mean, is, is the most successful and most valid and legitimate academically and, and through policy perspectives, it is the most successful terminology. But now you have an identity of the Zo community from Manipur, like the Paite, Gangte, Vaipi, Pado, Mar, Kom, all challenging the Mizo ID. And also in Myanmar, you have the chins flowing into Mizoram and, uh, and Manipur, calling themselves Mizo now. So in this particular context, Professor, uh, uh, now talking about William, I mean, uh, Professor James Scott's book, The Art of non -govern Not Governing, and the art of not not governance, uh, the art of uh, what is uh, not the art of not not being governed. I'm sorry. So his, uh, I mean, talking about his, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> book, he says he argues that all the zoo community are common to Southeast Asia, China, and parts of South Asia. And also, Professor, I've talked with Dr. Uh, Lamkhan Piang, who is now a university uh, professor in the University of Hyderabad, but he was in C Triple S in JNU. So he says that the Tedimchin, the Paites, and the Mizos are one family. But the Mizos feel that the Mizos are common to only Mizoram. So in this particular context, Professor, what do you what do you think? Do you think that the greater Mizo nation or the Mizo country will be successful in the long run, or will there be contestations to the Mizo identity in the future? So that's my question. Please. OK, there are uh, direct questions for all three. Let's take just one more, then let uh... Uh, panelists respond, and then I'll come. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and I'll come to you uh, on the next round. Uh, my question is to Dr. Fukan. Uh, I think it was a very interesting and very radical sort of reading of the Assam movement. Uh, my question is that I also found it, however, a little problematic given the fact that you know. Uh, you tend to sort of, you know, neutralize uh, the element of resistance, which was very much an integral part of the Assam movement. When you look at the uh, agitators as mob, you term them as mob, or you know, you call you know, the terms that you use. I think it uh, sort of takes away from the context, uh, the in which the agitation unfolded, and uh, when you call them rioters, for example. Uh, because uh, one, of course, did I grew up in the 1980s, so I did see the violence unfolding as well. But uh, you also went for one of the most popular marching songs that you had at that point of time was Bhupen Hazarika's song, Ah Ahu Laija Khojak Janat. And Khojak means enlightened. So that kind of contradicts the whole idea of the people as, you know, as uh, unaware of what is happening. The idea of the mob is, I think, I find that a little problematic. Yeah. No, I'll, no uh, my, uh, my point is simply opposite. What I'm saying that consciousness is already, you know, it's a sort of a, uh, it's a sort of a conscious decision of the people. And it's not like the, the cultural procession of Guwahati, uh, the people who were there in, the, in, the, in that uh, cultural procession are actually the rioters. But what I'm saying, there's a there's a universalization of that that aggressiveness in that in that particular uh, you know particular radical sort of uh, period. Uh, not exactly entire uh, six years. Let's say 82, 83, mostly 82, uh, mostly eight, last part of 82 and uh, you know 83. So it's a conceptual similarities between rioting crowd and procession crowd, uh, you know, conscious individual, then how do you, that's, that's the trajectory, historical trajectory. So, so there's, a, there's a mass gathering, people were agitated, people would come to, you know, Bihu, Bihu, Han Milans, and suddenly someone, uh, you know, perform a Hindi song and people immediately uh, get agitated and they would, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they would try to, you know, uh, 
threaten the, the committee members and sort of things. Then in by 1990s, that mass was sort of disappeared from the from the political scene. Then now the writers were became uh, sort of individual two, two you know two guys with a with a motorcycle they would go uh, they would uh, you know rob a bank or they would kill a Bengali you know uh, a businessman or Marwari businessman. So that 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 the structure of riot continued, but the mass uh, the but the shift was like there's a you know mass uh, there was a mass sort of hesitation or mass rioters in you know some movement and then that the structure uh, you know became sort of a individual ways of you know doing riot or doing violence that's what I'm trying to say I hope I sort of secondly should I indigeneity and 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 resource extraction. There are many interesting works on uh, these uh, uh, this this uh, this question of resource extraction and its effect on you know shaping up the the sort of uh, identities of indigeneity. Let's say in Assam Nagaland border, uh, in Arunachal Assam border, in 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 uh, in in this Oil India. Uh, you know, operative areas in upper Assam. There are interesting works coming up. So that's true. But Bepe and uh, Bepe and Sanjeev Burwa recently, they have also shown that how indigeneity, uh, the actually sort of exploiting uh, uh, the local, uh, you know, resources and kind of destroying the environment, particularly in Meghalaya with coal and all. And it is it is happening in everywhere actually in Mizoram, Assam Nagaland border, uh, and then then the, the the militants are now joining with you know so called outsiders, you know traders, and they were like kind of this is a this is a destructive sort of a depoliticized uh, you know resource ex extraction is going in, on and on in North East India, so it's very complex. Okay, uh, Joy, would you like to take the question that was posed to you? Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Um, thank you, John, for the question. And uh, there's a long answer and there's a short answer. And I think I'll go for the short answer, which is that, uh, you know, with regard to understanding identity and uh, in, in the Northeast, um, I think we are often um, sort of uh, challenged by ideas of... Uh, primordiality and, and, and constructivist ideas. And I think very often we sort of uh, sort of try and um, work our arguments through these two ideas, you know, and then uh, they don't always come together. So uh, I think as academics, we are looking at how ideas of identity are constructed rather than looking at primordial understanding of identity. So therefore, to your question of how do you see the identity of Mizzou spanning out and things like that, it's very difficult to say, except to say that as, as academics, I think we have to look into trying to see how the idea of identity is a construction rather than a primordial reality. So that's my short answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Arkotong. Uh, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, I think my question was, or th the question was primarily about the appropriation of history, which again came up um, kind of in the previous like discussion as well. I, I think um, perhaps I'm a bit jaded, <laughs> I, I, you know, after just coming kind of out of the field and kind of written you know a book on the Hindu right. I think. Um, well, what is important to uh, kind of understand, I think, is that um, kind of appropriation of history and interpretation of it. I think all kind of nationalist groups do that, um, and I think we have to kind of recognize that. Now, the thing about the Hindu right appropriating or hijacking kind of indigenous histories 
is is something to step back and reflect a bit more upon because it is not only the hindu right who are doing it it's also the indigenous alliance or, or the kind of indigenous elite who, you know who are also participating in this right so i think that's something to even think about because then our this whole kind of idea of indigeneity as this as this pure idea um i think needs to be suspended a bit i think because they are different actors who are involved in appropriating these kind of histories across so it's of course the sang parivar are there to embellish it and to exaggerate it but at the same time what is happening is that a lot of the indigenous actors are also participating in sort of appropriating their own kind of version of history that speaks to different audiences and, and i think that's the point that i would try to make in how we think about kind of northeastern histories um the point about elections uh, well i mean it's i mean it's really interesting and uh thank you crispin for bringing that up i mean of course like nagaland currently um people are saying that you know don't call the elections you know until and unless you know there is a like naga solution right and and kind of elections have always been a bit of in between space i think you know to participate in it you know it's seen as being a part of the indian kind of nation state and to not participate in it it's to kind of exercise some kind of like sovereignty and self uh, well self like determination so i think in the case of like nagaland at least i think it is quite interesting because it is not so much about proportional representation as such but i think it, it goes back to the unique history of the like naga people and questions around sovereignty and self-determination mm. uh, thank you i saw two hands up there and uh, in the same row uh, and you too well uh, let's see how ma- how many we can get in. We've already uh, yeah. and just be brief and to the point. Okay. So my question is directed to uh, Ankur Tawalif Khan. So I basically have two questions. One is a question which is directly related to what you spoke, and the second is a speculation that I want from yours, from you. So you have focused on the politics of symbols, right, uh, on gays. And uh, you have spoken about spoken dhul as a masculine insignia and everything. So also that today it happens to be Hilpi Dibokhi Nisam. And today is the death day of Jari Praharagogala, who is known for uh, symbolizing the Japi as the cultural icon. But I don't know whether it's a lacuna or an overlooking on your on on your gaze that when you have spoken, when you have focused on the dhul as a masculine agent, and there are some movement or the UL uh, or the Ulfa adoration, all are seen as. Uh, agitations which were in which the forefronts were led by masculine people because we always used to say Amar, Laura, or our boys. Now, how do you locate? Uh, I mean, these kinds. I mean, the existing particularisms, especially the unspoken consensus on uh, on Mekhela Sador as as the attire of convention for women folk in this entire. Uh, politics of symbolism in Assam agitation. B, how do you also look into the non-hegemonic uh, symbols that are at play in the in the, in the geo-body of Assam? For example, the Boru Arnai or the missing Arkok or the Ribiga Singh in this entire play of symbols. And secondly, the speculation. Uh, it's it's somehow an extension of what uh, Dr. Bose uh, asked you. Uh, I mean, uh, how do you say the contemporary links of Bihu with the rise of neoliberal capital and how to locate native capital with that because now Bihu is Bihu has become a stage thing, a stage Bihu where corporate advertisements are the major sponsoring things. And as you have already spoken in your speech, that Indian imperialists like Marwaris who were who were killed upon were are now the prime sponsors for stage Bihus. So how do you look into this yeah, East? Yeah. Okay. They have always been in that sense, but how do you look into this estrangement or this? Indonesian from the material ecological basis that Bihu has. These are my two Okay, hold, hold off on your answer. Let's collect the questions quickly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Riju. I uh, teach at uh, OP Jindal Global University. I'm a historian. Um, my questions are, or my one question, really brief, is for uh, both Professor Bachwao and uh, for uh, Arkitang. Uh, hello. Um, so, We've been sort of talking about this throughout, I think, that the basis upon which the category of indigeneity rests um, 
in the Northeast are, you know, one, the land and resources uh, around the land, and second, uh, religion, which has been brought up, but in a in a shadowy sense. So can can you both kind of um, tell us a little bit more about uh, the relationship between inhabitants and uh, people's sort of uh, relationship to religion, um, and how that uh, in in various ways uh, would uh, help in articulating an indigenous notion of an indigenous notion of identity. So just sort of center, sort of putting religion in the center of uh, discussion on indige indigeneity. And both of you have written on it in your books, which is why I, mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of prompt that question. Thank you. OK, thanks. Uh, so uh, and then we'll take a final question from you, and then I'll give the uh, uh, floor to the panelists for the I'm Roderick, I'm a PhD student. Okay. Um, I had a question that's related to the joy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so far our discussion, pretty heated discussion, is very centered around the indigeneity of people and communities. Um, I sort of want to bring the non humans and the modern humans, which is Professor Joy's uh, new re release book, uh, The Entangled Life, that's based on. So, my question, I guess, is to sort of how do we think about indigeneity, not just in a very human centric way, but in a more than human way of thinking, uh, which of course, um, in some of uh, Professor Alcotong's work has also sort of come out in the way that more than humans are used to assert indigeneity. Uh, but in terms of the long history in plant human and animal relationship, how do we understand and uh, in what ways can this frame of indigeneity be more inclusive? Uh, yeah, that's for Professor Joy. Thanks. Okay, so a final question from there. Um, I had a question. Uh, Mike made me nervous. I just had a two-part question. Um, the first one, uh, both the questions are concerning the politics of nature. Just introduce yourself briefly. Okay, uh, I'm okay. Uh, I'm Hydam, and I'm a PhD scholar at IIT Delhi. Um, yeah. So uh, my question is concerning the politics of naming and the ideological nuances of the the, the, of the terms that we're talking about, subject to its epistemological context. Uh, the first question is directed towards Professor Akutong Longkumar. Um, I wanted to ask, are our theorizations of ourselves and our own identities still being influenced to some extent uh, by an Indo-European standard? I begin with the identity marker assigned to me by the state, that is, or the scheduled tribe. My education and my Aadhaar card has been assigned to me as per this category. Uh, while one can argue that accessibility to resources has been made possible through reservations such as these, uh, the state seems to name our differences even as there is an attempt at integration, whether that be to um, supporting uh, religious movements like the Heraka, so the religious movement at the Heraka, or uh, whether it be to uh, like the promise of development. Uh, so how do we read this uh, territorialization? Uh, will history of the Northeast uh, always be uh, have, will always face this duality of uh, being read with the prefix tribal, like uh, in the earlier panel of, of speaker had said, tribal anxieties and tribal aspirations. So will our histories be constantly read with this prefix or within the category indigenous, which, which itself is at times uh, contradictory? So I wanted to ask a question about the performative, performativeness of citizenship and the degrees to this performance. And my second question is to Professor Joy. Um, how do we approach the term indigenous when our very histories are those which uh, refute a cohesive sort of origin narrative? Uh, if the meaning of rum, which is, uh, you said, land, which translates in my community, Zena, also as well as, I think, in Yangmayo to some extent, uh, if the meaning of rum is uh, irrevocably uh, tied down to the love for the land, how do we approach the question of migration then? Like, for example, there are so many, uh, there are many Naga communities which carry motifs in our shawls, the cowrie motifs, which um, seashells, uh, which kind of denotes that uh, we migrated from a place, not that we don't live there currently. Yeah. So just these two questions. Thank you. Oh, very good questions, both. So let's go in reverse order uh, and have Onkur uh, and Joy and then Arkotong uh, give their final responses and I'll wrap up after that. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, like the Gamusas are masculine, uh, it's a symbol of masculine might of. Uh, you know, Assamese nation, and then uh, to resist that, then, you know, Boru, Arnais turned up, you know, but there was, at a certain point of time, 
like Bhupen Hazarika's, you know, cap, that Nepali cap. It was a, it was sort of a representational politics. We also did at a certain point of time. But now it, it all, all, it all becomes, uh, you know, simple commodities. Uh, you, you get these things in, you know, in, in, you know, fancy stores. So, and uh, if you see, I don't know, I haven't, uh, uh, I haven't uh, really you know, sort of traced 2012 violence in Boruland. So, I, I don't know what Aruna, Aruna would mean at that point for, you know, Muslims, for uh, Baganias uh, at that point of time. So, it's, it's very difficult, uh, you know, uh, as, as a historian, we should also, you know, think about the time. Uh, secondly, the, the problem is com uh, uh, this invasion, investment of mul uh, you know metrop uh, metropolitan you know sort of capital in Bihu stages are it's it's I don't think it's a it's a very serious problem. The serious problem is like new liberal uh, you know fantasy for organic sort of things, right? So it somehow changed. That's what I'm I, I was like trying to argue. It somehow change the, you know, sort of mediation kind of, uh, the, the mediative possibility has changed. Now, you know, now, uh, now a, 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 an individual, like, a, you know, Ujan Bajar, uh, you know, uh, Baidu's, uh, tribal Baidu's, we are not, uh, we are not shopping uh, their, you know, vegetables uh, because they are organic. No. But because, uh, you know, uh, the Baidu is organic. The Baidu is tribal. That means it's 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 not. Uh, you know, it should be organic. And there are like Mias. You know, have you seen that those things? Like there's Mia. Nobody goes there. So this is like you know inorganic. Uh, you know, poisoned food, and this is organic because the the the, the body is tribal. The body is indigenous. So this is a very uh, this is a very difficult time to kind of uh, think about uh, a politic uh, you know sort of a democratic politics. I'm like really worried about these things. Yeah. Right. Thank you for uh, those very interesting uh, questions and the issues that I've not really thought about. So maybe I'll make up along the way. Um, so with regard to uh, religion and uh, indigeneity, yeah, um, I can, as a, uh, you know, I can only speak for the Mizo case, and that is, um, in the case of the Mizos, there is uh, an assumption that if you are a Mizo, you're if you're a Mizo, you're a Christian. So those, you know, and Mizos, as you know, ethnic Mizos at least, you know, are 99.9% .9 Christian. Uh, so, um, so therefore, you cannot, at least at this stage, imagine a Mizo who is a non-Christian, and therefore a non-Christian being a Mizo, right? So, uh, so in this uh, in this um, recent migrations into Mizoram, there have been migrations from the Chakma from Bangladesh side, and uh, and migrations from the from the eastern neighbors as well from Myanmar, and the. People from the east are welcomed with open arms, essentially because they're Christian. Whereas from the Bangladesh side, there is a lot of uh, reticence and even anger in that kind of migration because they're not Christian. So, in the sense, I think indigeneity also articulates itself in the form of a particular religion. Okay, so that's the first thing, and the second thing that Roderick posed about non-human and um, and indigeneity in that regard. I think uh, since you referred to the book that Willem van Skendel and I wrote and was published this earlier last year, um, I think the book also talks about how um, non-humans have uh, constituted um, the people of the region. And the book was an investigation on how uh, uh, ideas of who you are are not just dependent upon how you act upon nature but how nature as a whole acts upon you and how the non-humans uh, non-humans constitute people so and we spoke about food we spoke about nature and things like that so um, so i think the book is not an exploration about specific and it's quite difficult to kind of uh, specify 
how say among the nagas the you know gets articulated in particular ways but it is a way of looking at the region as a whole and how the region sort of has a peculiarity in the way the non humans have related with the region so for instance it's a very interesting uh, thing that we brought out in the book which is that you know the glutinous rice uh, sticky rice that we often talk about uh, the borders of sticky rice actually ends in northeast india whereas the rest of india does not have sticky rice so not sticky rice and so therefore the relations with southeast asia and up to japan comes across through the sticky rice or fermented foods you know it comes out from that region and then of course milk producing and non milk produce in the northeast we are not a milk product eating region whereas so in a way what we are trying to say is that how these i think how non humans in a sense or more than humans sometimes you call, i mean different words are being used these days have constituted the region and given a particular identity to the region which is contiguous with the regions further east as well so i think that that's the broad way in which i would sort of respond to your question but if you look at particular communities then there are different ways of understanding uh, uh, those aspects like for instance the idea of sacred groves is not common throughout the region you know there are only certain like manipur and uh, meghalaya are very important so so i think you can kind of think about it in those terms and uh, yeah uh, i mean it calls for a lot of uh, research in future so that's one thing that i wanted to point out so yeah and the third question i think was also a very interesting question about migration and how do we understand yes i think this is one thing that we all have to understand that, that all communities have migrated uh, and so and the northeast is not uh, so if when you say indigenous i don't know whether one means indigenous at the time of the arrival of the british you know from that point of time because prior to that everybody was in movement you know and it's only that's why the territorialization of identity comes uh, is is very important at that particular stage but i want to uh, you give the example of kauris um to suggest that um to suggest that there was migration and movement but i want to say that kauris are not um uh the example for migration because uh there's an article that i've written about it you might want to look at it and actually kauris are essentially only found in the maldives and so the from the maldives i think binyang and others have written about it uh from the kauris it has moved all and also david ladin has written about it has moved all the way up to bengal and from there moved up into the other regions going all the way up to yunnan and and in towards southeast asia i think it doesn't extend beyond thailand so the use of cowries as uh, as uh, as commodity of exchange as status thing and things like that is a result of um exchange of commodities rather than migration of people okay so i think that's uh, yeah, the other point that i just wanted to highlight as well thank you Thank you very much. Uh, now, yes, uh, Professor Longkuma. Thank you. Uh, like I must apologize, I didn't quite hear some of the questions that well. So I will try and answer as best I can. Um, the question about indigeneity and like religion is something which is quite important, I think. Uh, but I think there are different layers to how we can understand this kind of uh, like relationship. um in the naga context i think um when people talk about nationalism i think it is quite closely tied in with like religion and here i mean in particular like christianity so you often hear the trope naga lim for christ and that territorial idea kind of linked closely to like christianity is an important part of the like naga identity but when you take that kind of discourse to international say like forums like the like un uh like christianity is not really talked about as much so this idea of like naglan for christ does not come up um here the kind of 
this course I think shifts more towards talking about sovereignty and self uh, like determination and then if you read a lot of the like, UN transcripts you know the um, especially you know in the like, working group of indigenous peoples and so on and so forth the like Naga case kind of often sits within this idea of sovereignty and self-determination in a strikingly secular sense I would say but but if you go to like Nagaland, you hear this trope of like Nagaland for Christ a lot, right? So I think there are different ways in which indigeneity and kind of nationalisms, you know, as well as like religion is operationalized in these different settings. The second point I think which is important to make is also about spirituality. Um, so I have come across this new uh, or i mean at least to me this uh, this movement called the like moral rearmament like movement or kind of initiatives for change um and i've been kind of looking at two personalities actually um one from the sami people in this like northern like norway and the other like naga um and the the connection between these two people happened through the like moral rearmament like movement post like Vietnam War when um, um, so um, there was a cultural troupe called Songs Songs for Asia and they performed at different places to kind of articulate this idea of peace and this kind of relationship between different peoples and here this idea of spirituality actually comes about you know which is not similar to the the kind of like religious discourse that we often hear so ties to identity ties to land the importance of tradition and so on but also the importance of peace and kind of reconciliation and the songs for asia i mean is an important platform because i think it is articulating indigeneity from a very different perspective again so here you have the like maoris you have mizos you have kasis you have nagas you have uh, like, uh, like Laotians, Vietnamese, and all of them coming together and performing their kind of identity at this uh, stage, and they travel all over the world. So that they they travel to uh, like Europe, they travel to like North America, and so on. So I think that articulation of spirituality in that context is very very interesting that we have not really heard much about. I think the the third the third aspect is i think for the hindu right uh like religion is crucial to kind of expressions of indigeneity um that uh, like religion off the soil is what makes a community indigenous so i mean christians to them are not indigenous because their traditions come from the like middle east or come from somewhere else, right? And same with Islam, it comes from somewhere else. So they're foreign. Um, so it's the non-Christian traditions which are more important. So here again, kind of religion comes to the fore in articulating a sense of indigeneity for the Hindu right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I did want to say another word about uh, Crispin's question on proportional representation even though uh, Arkothong has addressed it uh, somewhat, I think uh, that kind of uh, electoral reform is more desperately needed in the so-called heartland, uh, such as Uttar Pradesh, where minorities uh, are totally uh, unrepresented, uh, almost uh, disenfranchised. And when it comes to uh, the other provinces which are far away from the Indian political center, uh, and certainly in the Northeast. Uh, I, I don't think that we can uh, avoid uh, addressing questions of uh, sovereignty and self-determination, as Arkothong put it. I mean, there the solution must lie within a capacious uh, uh, concept of layered and shared sovereignty. Simply tinkering with the rules of representative politics, in my mind, uh, will not do. I think uh, we have had a, a terrific uh, panel, in fact, a wonderful day of deliberations uh, on society, culture, and uh, politics of the, uh, of the Northeast. Uh, you know, it has been a true delight for me to see so many 
young uh, uh, faces uh, in the audience. And I think uh, while we obviously must be most grateful to our speakers who made uh, excellent presentations, I have been equally impressed uh, by the questions and uh, searching questions and insightful comments uh, that have come uh, from, uh, from members of the audience. Uh, it is not very often that we have uh, scholarly uh, exchanges uh, of uh, this, uh, you know, quality about the, the Northeast. I hope we will have uh, more of these in the future. Uh, finally, I'd like to really thank uh, the other fellows of the Mittal Institute who played key roles, uh, the fellows other than Onkur, uh, the entire staff uh, of the uh, Mittal South Asia Institute's uh, Delhi office, those who have helped uh, with uh, technology uh, since we had at least uh, a couple of presenters joined uh, from far away. Uh, places. And finally, uh, the staff have told me that there is uh, high tea awaiting all of you uh, outside. Uh, we have uh, gone half an hour beyond our closing time. Uh, this is simply to show that, uh, you know, how engaged uh, the conversation has been on, on India's Northeast. So thank you very much to all of you.